This is a Hot Pie Media Original. Welcome to Overcome. Hi, friends. Hello, Overcomer. How are you? I hope you're doing well today, and we have a show for you that you don't want to miss. This is my great friend, the musician Sat Sung, which is actually spelled Sat Sang, but pronounced Sat Sung, and it's Drew McManus. He, over this last year, has truly become one of the better friends, if not one of the best friends I've ever had in my life. Um, which I think speaks a lot to his character. Um, he's a guy that is one of the realest. He never sugarcoats anything. He's also hilarious, but he has a story of overcoming that you're going to be inspired by. You really will. He has songs like I am between grow. He's got a new album all right now. He's coming to Austin soon. He's got a whole new tour. He's that got he talks a whole new about. tour. Yeah. So yeah. I'm so excited to release this because his tour dates are out now and he's everywhere from, um, it, it begins, I believe October 14th. At least that's what I see on his website. And so, um, so it's pretty soon. So grab tickets. It's everywhere. Minnesota, Missouri, Iowa, uh, through Illinois, and then coming on down through Boulder, then to Miami, San Diego, all around California. And then coming down to Texas, he'll hit Dallas, Houston, Austin, and yeah. then ending in Monterey. You, but the, actually, no, he's ending it here in Austin in December. So yeah. uh, his date in, in Monterey is not till uh, next year. Yeah. Well, if you can get tickets and go, I highly encourage it because it's one of the most engaging concerts, whether it's his full band, which this will be, or him playing solo up there. And we got to go to one of his shows. And he actually dedicated his song, I Am, to me because I am a two-time suicide survivor or suicide overcomer. And he dedicated that to me because it's one of the most powerful songs in the world to me. It's been one of the most meaningful songs to me ever. I've cried numerous times listening to it in dark times and in just meditation, like it brings a tear to my eyes. It reminds me that I deserve to be here. And so I even sang it to you once. Yeah. You sang it to me in Costa Rica. You dedicated it to me with a lot of our great friends. You sang that over me, uh, to me. You surprised me on your show, the Amy Edwards show Mm -hmm. when he was a guest for your podcast, which was awesome as well. I got to sit in on that. And then you surprised me by him singing it to me the first time, uh, live on your show, the Amy Edwards show. And that was beautiful. Yeah. It already brought me to tears when you told me it was happening uh, beforehand, which was great. And it was so meaningful to me that that you would go out of your way for that, that he would come down here for that. Yeah. And it was right yeah, here at Hot Pie. It was, it was right here at Hot Pie. So thank you, Hot Pie, mm-hmm. for everything you do for Amy's show, everything you do for my show, making it possible. And Drew's story of how he overcame suicide. I'm looking over your shoulder right now. Amy, say something. So the camera goes to you on YouTube. Okay. Three, 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 a magic three, three, number three. right behind you. <laughs> and, uh, and the words that he has has been magical in my life. Uh, the music he puts out is so meaningful. It's one of the things he's one of the musicians that his lyrics, his songs will move you deeply. I don't think you have an option about it. Well, because he lived it yeah. and that's what he shares. He shares his addiction, abuse, near death, alcoholism, you know, when you yeah. live it, man, it's powerful. Mm-hmm. Just like you. And I love that even on the show. Well, thank you. And I think on the show, he talks about how he will throw stuff out if it sounds like another artist, if it reminds him of another song. He says it needs to be a song from him, from his soul, from deep inside, from the well that is within him. And I think that's beautiful. And for an artist to make it harder on himself, to throw something out because it reminds them of something else. I'm like, dude, if it sounds good, like let it out. (laughs) But, uh, one of the incredible moments I just had with them was when I was in New York, he knew I was walking the Brooklyn bridge with Chris, Chris Murphy, a friend of this show, a friend of me who hugged me out on it, who after my Joe Rogan appearance said he was going to go, he was on his way to jump off the Brooklyn bridge. I went that to, to that bridge with him. 
I went to the subway station where he was jumped and hit in a metal, uh, hit in the face with a metal bat. And he lost nine teeth that day, was in the ICU for three or four days. Went by the hospital, went by the subway station, went on the Brooklyn Bridge. And when we were done, guess who FaceTimed me? Who? Satsung. That's right. Drew. I knew that. Actually. And he, uh, well, the listeners didn't. So no. <laughs> it, it was incredible because he spoke life over and into Chris. And what was really cool about it was I had just shown, Drew had texted me, but I had just shown Chris, I am. And yeah, I'm tuned in. We were tuned in and uh, he was on the road and he FaceTimed me. And I scroll over to Chris and his eyes were still misty from hearing that song. And Chris goes, this is the guy. This is the guy. I go, yeah, it's the guy. It's Drew. It's that song. And the way that he shared challenges and Chris had just had something challenging come up after we got off the Brooklyn Bridge. There's some family dynamics in the way that that Drew handles those family dynamics, setting boundaries. Um, you know, even shared with Chris, Hey, when good things happen, you know, sometimes, you know, there's crabs in a bucket and he goes, he said something, I go, you better write a song about that <laughs> because Drew talked about whenever he went to rehab, his family was mad at him for going and getting help. Whenever he became a musician and started pursuing his, his, his life calling his purpose, some of his family got mad at him. And so when Chris was going through something, uh, Drew said, you know, there can't be lions without vultures or there mm -hmm. can't be vultures without lions. And he goes, bro, you're stepping into being coming a lion. You are deep inside. Every one of us is a lion. And even in the song, he says he's in that lion's den. And then he mm -hmm. realizes that I am one too. Mm -hmm. So anyways, not to make this intro too long, but wow. Did Drew speak into the life of someone that really needed it? And he's spoken to my life when I really needed it too. And I think he's going to speak into your life right now as you listen to this show. Stay tuned, buckle up, because it's quite a ride and you're going to love it. Stick around to the end too. Drew McManus, Satsung. Yeah. One of my, to me, man, you're, I consider you one of my best friends already. Yes. Yeah. yeah likewise. And uh, we've connected just quick, fast hard and uh man i love you i love you too dude yeah you're one of my favorite people thank you bro you're one of my favorite people without a shadow of a doubt drinking the alpha brain right off the start oh shout out on it thank you yeah hey actually something to celebrate yes. they're actually my first sponsor of this podcast cool yeah and, yeah uh, i'm really grateful because i've been taking their stuff for years mm -hmm. same yeah. And so congratulations to you too. We're yeah. two new, new guys on the block. I know it, dude. Yeah. On a pro five. team. On a pro team. I, 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 so I was telling Amy last night and not to do an ad <laughs> during the show right off the start, but no, I was telling Amy, uh, that, um, actually, why don't we do that? Uh, Amy is actually the producer of the show and this is my second show to record. And so a little introduction to her. Hi, Amy. Yeah. Hi. Hi, Amy. I'm well, so excited. I'm so excited you're here. And you're my babe. What'd you say last night at dinner? We were just sitting there and I was like, Amy, you're a babe. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Yeah. It's one of those surprise compliments that's going to stick with me. So. Good. Yeah. 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 Well, it wasn't just a surprise uh, one. You, you For your podcast, you had five of your podcast guests, me, Drew. Yeah, that was funny. Brigham, Aaron, <laughs> Sky. Sky all there at dinner impromptu. And then you got to lay across the sea of men, <laughs> the meat wall, the meat wall. Yeah. dude, <laughs> Bringing it back, bringing it back. Um, and that was fun. So anyways, I'm, I'm so excited that she's, she's part of the show. Yeah. Uh, she's got me too. tons of experience in radio. So we're going to make sure the audio sounds great. And, um, she's a rock star. I love her. Thanks. Facts. Babe. Yeah. And you're going to kill at this. I'm so excited. This hey. is our first one in the studio too. So, yeah. you know, we're just getting our kinks knocked out and that kind of thing. Yeah. Dude, I couldn't think well. of a better person to have a podcast. Cause one thing I always tell people about you that is the, like the proof in the pudding of your just genuineness in your heart is you might be the most interesting person I know as far as the what? things that you've done wow. and the, like the work that you've done for other people. And anytime you're in a group of people, you never talk about yourself. Your always are like, Hey, Drew. Tell them that thing. Hey, Brigham, tell them that thing about this. Like you so want everyone else to tell everyone, show everyone else what they do. 
which I, it's just a testament to the person you are, which oh. I would imagine would make a phenomenal podcast host. Hey, you know, you. <laughs> like you, you're really good at pulling stories out of people. You wow. Know? Well, I want to pull some stories out of you. And that's an incredible uh, compliment. So I received that. Thank yeah. you. The thing that I want to do um, is be an includer, right? The amazing, yes. incredible people that have been, that have come into my life like you. Mm -hmm. I want to have a platform to share that with the world. And I was telling Amy on the way in here, we, we had a time of kind of prayer and meditation before we came in. And that's something I'm so grateful for her for, because it keeps me centered. Actually, we have a, a video up or a screen up and it's got, got your babe summer yeah on it three very great pictures we have our, yeah. our mutual friend rashad rashad and then you playing at, red, playing rocks. at red rocks and then my beautiful wife yeah. yeah and i think uh i read somewhere maybe it's that post on your instagram at satsung spelled s-a-t-s-a-n-g of her um of summer it it shows uh you said something about without this woman i would be an absolute liability yeah yeah <laughs> Yeah, no, she's my, uh, she's my North star and my compass, you know, and I, I always say whenever I'm leaving home, the things I always keep at the forefront of my mind when I'm traveling is I'm, I'm representing her and our family and my gym. So I try to walk in a way that I would get approval from both of those parties, you know? Wow. Um, yeah, she's the most amazing thing in the world. Yeah, yeah. I love her so much. Yeah. She's awesome, man. Uh, Amy and I got to spend time with her. We took her to picnic. Yeah. Uh, the restaurant here in Austin that they know my order and know that I'm going to talk five of six people at the table and to get in my same order. Yep. That was what all my kids got. Was <laughs> yeah, the chicken. Yeah, they, yeah. They did the chicken fried chicken, gluten free. Yeah. On a bed of Brussels sprouts. Yeah. No, that, that place is ridiculous. The smashed potatoes on the side. But, uh, I had such a a joy. I, I think they were wanting to get out and go see the the bats in Austin. Like yeah, yeah, the, yeah. Uh, whatever the not the migration, but there's just like, Amy could help me with that. What what's the going on with the bats uh, in oh. Austin? I haven't seen them yet. <laughs> they just like live under this bridge and fly around at night, right? That's what they do. Like yeah. thousands. I haven't seen them. Yeah, yet. thousands. Pretty, I've been here for six months or more, and I haven't seen them yet. But we're the bat thousands. capital of the world. You know what? I've lived here for 27 years and I haven't seen him yet either. Oh, <laughs> uh, we probably need to go do that. Yeah, maybe next time together. summer's in yeah, town yeah, with the summer. kids. I really should do that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah but I, um, I, I think we had such a great dinner with your family and that they didn't get to go do it at least that night. The sun was already sat, set. And, but whenever I was looking at summer, having a conversation with her, I just had that thought of, you know, behind every good man's a great woman. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> Very true in my scenario. Yeah, me too. Yeah. yeah. Me too. I got, got Amy over there and, uh, and I guess, I mean, not to go on and on about them, but, uh, we, we like the, 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 w our women have aged like fine wine. Yeah. That's what, dude, yeah. I was just telling Summer that last <laughs> night I saw a picture of her when we first met and she is, she just keeps getting hotter. It's so weird. Like I look at pictures of her when she was in her late twenties. I'm like, yeah, you're cute. You're like a smoke show now though. Yeah. And like, as she keeps getting older, she just keeps getting hotter. It's really yeah. weird. It's awesome. What's the age difference between you guys again? Is it nine, nine years? Nine yeah. years. Yeah. Well, I, I love, um, everything about you and about your relationship with summer. I mean, she's been there for me mm -hmm. in tough times. She's been there for Amy in tough times that, that we've had. And, um, brother, I'm just so grateful for the man that you are. Cause we've had similar struggles, but before, I mean, I'd love to talk a little bit, set the stage or context of, of the man that you are. Um, you're a martial artist, mm -hmm. but you're also, uh, an incredible musician. You have the voice of an angel. <laughs> you write songs better than Chris Stapleton or oh, as, as good, Atlanta. as good. And, uh, and to me, you do because some of your songs are my go-to on my daily playlist. Mm -hmm. One for sure. Um, but one of them changed my life. I'm like any song ever has. Mm -hmm. And that's where we first connected. Yep. It was after I heard I am, um, after a suicide attempt. Mm -hmm. And that was my second suicide attempt. Mm -hmm. And that song just changed something in me. It resonated so deeply. And it hit home and I can, I can, I can take inspiration from just saying that, that that's what your song did to me. Mm -hmm. And I hope this podcast will do that for someone else. You yeah, know, that, sure that will. this will be so meaningful to them, but that song, I mean, parts of it, you know, I, I deserve to be here. And so do you. Mm -hmm. 
there's so many good things about, about I am. There's another one about, uh, I would grow. Mm -hmm. I think, I think your music is an invitation. Yeah. Whenever you say everything that's new to me is an opportunity to grow mm -hmm. and you can grow too. Mm -hmm. I think that you're, where, do, where does the inspiration come from for your music? Well, I feel like, you know, I write from such a subconscious place. Like I never am like, oh, I'm going to sit down and write about this. Yeah. Um, you know, usually it just happens really fast. Um, but what I always feel like I'm doing is like writing letters to myself that then I can like show other people. So I'm always kind of, you know, I feel like all those older songs, everything on the story of you was me like beginning to understand the path. Mm. So I was like writing about the path and then my relationships with those songs changed because I would be going through shit, especially touring and being homesick and all the stuff that just comes with being gone all the time. And my relationships to those songs, I was like, oh damn, these are like, these are my mantras. Like these yeah. were things that I wrote subconsciously, like for myself. I think when you're writing from a place of like, like you said, Stapleton, I think the reason that people love his music so much is he writes from a place where you're like, oh yeah, I can relate exactly to what that feeling is. Yeah. You know? So I'm always trying to write from my heart and not my head, you know, which is why I don't, I don't ever sit down and try to write a song. Like it's either happening or it's not happening. Yeah. You know? I like that. Yeah. Where I'm trying on the, on the good ones, I think I'm just like an antenna or a vessel Ooh. for the thing to come through. It's not necessarily me trying to say anything. It's just like me getting out of the way and letting what I know in my deepest self come through. Yeah. You know, what do you think that comes from you being a martial artist? Like there's a practice to it. Right. And in martial arts, there's times to force things mm -hmm. and there's times to just let it flow. Mm -hmm. And, um, and there's, there's practice. And as you practice that you, you come to know when I'm trying to force it and they feel it and I'm telegraphing it and they know exactly what I'm going to do because I'm trying to force this. Mm -hmm. So they're more prepared to, to, you know, defend yep. or counter mm -hmm. <laughs> and make it hurt. Yeah. Uh, but then whenever you get in the flow and you're just like, I'm chain, I'm chaining these moves together. Like, uh, we call it chain wrestling. Yep. Um, we're linking these things together and I'm going to go here, then there, I'm going to threaten two things at once. I'm going to take one of them or three things at once mm -hmm. and take one of them. But uh, while you're writing a song, are you trying to lyrics? I mean, I'm, I'm not, I wrote a book, but I'm not a, a lyrical writer, however you call it, songwriter. Mm -hmm. And, but are you trying to link things, not trying, but are you linking things together as they just kind of flow? Yeah. I mean, usually it just will start out with a sentence. Like I'll have a line, you know, dude, I was, I was talking to Brady last night about this. I spend a lot of time thinking about thinking, like I think about <laughs> how I think, yeah, why I think that way. And I try to like trace the pathology back. So I think because I'm always in that space of like, of turning my wheels, that if a sentence or a phrase or something hits me, that my brain just like starts connecting the dots, Ooh, you know, and I just I like, like it just starts going and then it kind of rounds itself up. You know, I don't, I'm never really in charge of the damn thing, you yeah. know, and I either will fall in love with it right away or I'm like, nah, that's not, that's not a good one. Right. Um, so yeah, I never am really trying to do anything it just like happens. Like, I think these songs are like stored in me and my subconscious. And mm. then every once in a while I can just like pull it down. I see that, man. You, you, I mean, I know that maybe you can talk a little bit about, well, one, I mean, you have done a lot uh, in your career, <laughs> a lot. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, from playing at Red Rocks, which I still haven't been to a concert there, but God, I want to see it. And I want to see you there. Yeah. Hopefully we'll do it again next year. Yeah, man. I can't wait. I will be there. I don't care what I have to clear. Yeah. I'll bump back a fight if, yeah. if it's the same <laughs> night. I'm not kidding. I will. Because, uh, because I really, really want to see you perform there. Um, that's a magical place to me. That's where I would, you know, with, with at the time, uh, grudge fight, fight team, but Trevor Whitman, mm -hmm. um, Hall of Fame coach, Rashad, Justin Gaethje, Rose Nama Yunus, Brendan Schaub, Dwayne Bang Ludwig. Uh, Kamara's times, over there now. Yeah. Uh, George St. Pierre would come. We would, we would be running uh, Red Rocks. And then those, I don't know, you call them planters on the side. Mm -hmm. We would, uh, you know, right where people would walk yep. into their rows, we would be jumping up on those, you know, kind of pushing yourself up and then going to the next one, pushing and they get taller and yep. taller and taller as you go higher. So it gets harder and harder and mm -hmm. harder. But man, sometimes getting out in nature um, and having to run out there 
was some of the most like mind clearing mm-hmm. um, kind of moments of of my training because you're always in your your head a lot of times. Yeah. And so it'd get you out of there where you're in nature. And I just can't imagine, you know, connecting nature and your music. Dude, it's uh, a heavy, yeah. it's a heavy place. You know, like you, you feel it right when you're there. Like that's a natural formation. Mm. You know, that wasn't a man-made thing. They built the stage, but like that opening. Yeah. Like if you look around that area, there's no other spot like that. Like there's nowhere like that in the world, yeah. really. Mm. So it was weird because I think the blessing of getting to play it was that we had all this time off. Where I feel like if we would have played Red Rocks in the middle of a festival season, it would have just been another show. Like would have been cool, but it would have still just been like, oh yeah, it's just another big show that we have this summer. Where with all that time off, we went in just like, okay, so we're back and we're going to do this, you know? But dude, I walked out on the stage while they were like still setting up gear and my heart just like stomach dropped and you're just like, holy shit, we're Red Rocks, man. And it's like... As a musician, it's like the Mecca because yeah. you name anybody they played there. What would it be? It would be, so in fighting, you always want to fight at Madison Square Garden. Yeah, you, same vibe. Music, it's like, it's Red Madison Rocks. Square Garden's Red Rocks. Yes. Yeah. And I think Red, Red Rocks more than Madison Square Garden just because it's this natural formation and like everyone, dude, like the Beatles, the Grateful Dead, the Rolling Stones, Pink Floyd, like yeah. everyone has played there. So there you have this thing where you're on stage and you're like, I'm on the stage that all of these dudes played on, you know, like it's just Janis Joplin, you know, like, what the fuck? How did yeah. we get here? <laughs> you know, how did we get here? <laughs> did you hear the story about the tool concert there? Yeah. The guy that made the fire. Yeah. yeah I was there No, I was in at the concert, but I used to live above Red Rocks yep. and I could hear some of the music. Yeah. Um, and it was awesome. But we saw the fire there when they did that. <laughs> yeah. What a, what a thing. Man. Uh, They've changed a lot of security the, okay, shit since then. I bet. Cause yeah. uh, it would be a hard rock face to climb Especially up Especially to be like, all right, I have to collect wood on you my collect way wood, up. Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's intense, man. Well, let's, let's go back to how we connected if that's all right. Yeah. Please. I mean, um, from your perspective, when I reach out, I know, I know in my story, I'm very grateful that I have encouraged, um, quite a few people that, that will reach out and tell me their story, mm-hmm. but you can't always get back to everyone on social. Cause if you do, sometimes that's, that that's, takes up so much of your time. Yeah. And then it opens a store where they'll keep, yep. keep walking through it. Right. Yep. And so whenever I reached out, I was just, I wanted to, I wanted to, I wanted to, and I waited and I waited and I waited. And then one day I was just like, I got it. I mean, I think it was after Amy and I had a meditation. We played that song. I cried. Um, and it wasn't the first time it made me cry. Yeah. Uh, and then you reached back out after I messaged you about how meaningful it was, how it's told me like, literally I, I, I understand now I deserve to be here after mm-hmm. that suicide attempt and waking back up and being like, holy shit, I'm still here. Mm-hmm. Fuck, I'm alive. Like, and I'm not done yet. And that's kind of what the the song did for me. But I don't know, man, I'm very grateful you did respond and reply. Well, man, I get a lot of messages about that song and I've heard some phenomenal stories, you yeah. know, but I kind of, you know, I'll, I'll about once a week, I'll like look at my message requests while Summer's putting Malachi to bed. And I read that and was so moved by it. So I reached back out. And then when we started going back and forth, I had heard every rep episode that you had done on Rogan, but like I told you, <laughs> I had, ne- I was always listening to it. I was never watching it. So yeah. in my head, I was like, Oh, it's like this one fifty five er you know, like I pictured this entirely different person, you yeah. know, like I pictured like some like little college backpacker kid that was also a fighter, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and, um, so when you're like, yeah, you know, I'm going on Rogan this week and I was like, oh, congrats. And you're like, yeah, it's like the eighth time. So then I was like, what? Cause I've been listening to Rogan since he started the podcast, you know? So then I looked at your profile and I was like, oh shit, that's the fight for the forgotten guy, you know? Yeah. Like, and it all clicked for me. So I was like freaking out telling my wife was like, you know, this is that guy that I was telling you about that <laughs> does the shit with the pygmies. So you know, one of my favorite moments in my life to date was like when Amy reached out and was like, Hey, would it be cool if I had Justin come by? I was like, yeah, like <laughs> that'd be super cool if you had Justin come by. So I felt like when we met, I was like a huge fan of you. You're a huge fan yeah. of me. So we were both like nervous and excited to meet each other. And <laughs> yeah. I like, that's usually not how it goes. It's usually like a one, yeah, one yeah, direction yeah. vibe. So it was just like a really 
awesome thing to be as excited to meet someone as they were to meet me, you know? Yeah. So it was one of my favorite moments in my life that first time we met. Man, well, I'm so grateful that we we did, that you did come and that Amy invited me to, to her episode on her podcast mm -hmm. with you. And then we did a second episode together where you, y'all surprised me where, um, you know, you played the song mm -hmm. live over me, man, that blessed the mess out of me. When Amy told me how to respond, Amy, you, I think you almost cried. Did you cry? <laughs> I think I did I a think little. You might've. Yeah. And it was just a really powerful moment because that yeah. song means so much to you, but now to me too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But you decided to surprise me and it was just epic. Yeah. It was epic. Well, um, what's crazy to, to you, bring that. I get chills every time I hear it. Well, and here's what's so crazy about that song is like, I wasn't super into it. Like I didn't write it and be like, oh man, this is the one, this is the one that everyone's going to connect with. It's by far our, our most known song, you know? Um, and like I said, I've gotten so many messages about it of similar stories, whether it be suicide or addiction. And it's just to me, this testament of like what the song is actually about, which is like, I didn't know I had that thing in me, but mm. like I trusted it. Mm. I saw the song all the way through and it's just like, if we're open and vulnerable and just willing to put ourselves out there, it's like, dude, you have no idea what you're capable of, yeah. you know, just by doing your thing, you know, just by me writing a song, which is something I do a lot, mm. you know, it's like, you have no idea how you're going to affect the world by just doing your thing. Yeah. Well, that, that brings up, I told you I had a, a story um, to share with you. It's pretty cool because it's it's happened because of a podcast also, me going on Rogan's. But um, I was going to ask you a question and it was, so we'll, we'll get to the, I'll, I'll set up the question. I'll tell you the story. But the question is what, what do someone listening to this that hasn't had a, a best hit song or that hasn't gone on Joe Rogan and shared their story that's been able to impact people. I think you nailed it with being raw and vulnerable because on January 27th, someone reached out to my message request, but I missed it. And it wasn't until I was out. It was either the day before we left for Vegas uh, for the Dustin Poirier, Conor McGregor mm -hmm. fight. So grateful. Dustin Poirier donated 50 grand. Manny Pacquiao donated He's the, 50 grand. He, he, I wish he everyone was like him, dude. I wish yeah. all, all fighters were Dustin? like Dustin? Yes. Yeah, me too. Um, I want to implement a lot in my comeback around what Dustin's done. Yeah. And he's an inspiration to me. It was awesome, man. After, after he beat McGregor and we went to the after party, he pulled me alone and, uh, he just told me some, some incredible things. Him and I were both like vibing chills, uh, a little misty eyed potentially. And, uh, I mean, I won't speak for him, but we were, we were just like so grateful for each other Yeah, and, and, and what we've been able to do together. So, but some people might say they, they don't have this big of a platform, yada, yada. So I want to hit on that in a minute because we all are called, I want this podcast, if I can share the goal, I want it to be one of the most, if not the most uh, pod, meaningful podcast in the world that just means the most that we have incredible stories come out. So I wanted to share this story of, of what is happening in between my first podcast and second podcast, which is you, at least that's where we're recording it at. And bro, it's, uh, it's this guy I was at on it mm -hmm. and I was working out at the on it gym and uh, it's a Thursday. This was last Thursday. So it's two Tuesday where we're, we're recording. And on Thursday, I have to leave from on it straight over to 10th planet to do jujitsu. And so I was getting out of there a little early. So the other guys weren't done working out, but one guy followed me out, like chased me out. And, uh, he stops me and he has tears in his eyes and I'm not exaggerating that. And he gives me the biggest hug, the biggest hug. And I'm like, Okay. And he, he takes a couple breaths. I call that kind of the, the Austin style hug where he mm -hmm. hug a little, a little long and, um, but he wasn't from here and he said, I'm the guy, I'm the guy. And I'm like, I don't, that didn't ring a bell to me. I'm like, I, you know, uh, so he, I, he, we, we looked at each other and I'm like, you gotta help me out, buddy. What's that mean? He goes, the Brooklyn bridge. And all of a sudden that clicked for me and I pulled him in and hugged him because on the day before I went out for the fights in Vegas, I did an IG live talking about Dustin's fight coming up and the donations and everyone in the IG live was saying, go read this comment, go read this comment. I must've missed it. And so I scroll up and I read it 
And I'm like, oh, wow. So this guy had a profile picture of the Brooklyn Bridge. When he said Brooklyn Bridge, it connected the dots for me. And he tells me the story in person. And basically, uh, COVID hit hard. He struggled with something you and I both have, have struggled with on and off. And um, it was addiction. And so he ended up homeless in Harlem. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, during COVID, homeless in Harlem. And he, out of meanness, someone hit him with a baseball bat and knocked out nine of his teeth. Wowzers. Nine of his front teeth. And so hurt, broke, stuck in the cycle of addiction. He decided he was going to take his life. And he walked to the Brooklyn Bridge um, from Harlem and was going to jump off of it. On January 27th or 28th, one of those two, he got a notification that Joe Rogan dropped a new episode. It was my podcast with him. And he said that right as he was coming up on the Brooklyn Bridge, I started sharing my story of addiction and how I felt gripped by it, that I attempted to take my life and that I woke up, saw the sunrise, thought I'm not done yet. I'm still here. This isn't my life. This isn't my legacy. Like I'm here to impact people. I'm here to, you know, fight for people. And so anyways, he, he said he decided not to do it. So the story goes on. I got this picture with him though. I'll have to show that to you. Uh, isn't that awesome? <laughs> So rad, <laughs> uh, raising his hand. Cause he's the champ. And then he hugged me and he said, today I have one month sober. And so he sent me a picture of him with, uh, a one month chip. Let me see where that is, but, uh, I'll find it one of these sometime and I'll show it to you, but it's him. Oh, here it is. It's him drinking a, uh, smoothie. He's got his one month chip. He's celebrating with, with me. And the next day I go to a rehab, I go to a treatment center and I share my story. It's one of those H and I's hospitals and mm -hmm. institutions. I'm there with my new boxing coach and sponsor. I'm there with my, uh, sparring partner. So I'm there with Jeff and, and Moose. And then all of a sudden, uh, he, he, uh, I, I share my story. And after the story, a guy sitting there, he's, uh, he's one of the guys in treatment. He's like 1920. He goes, we've been hearing about synchronicities and about being vulnerable. And yesterday I decided to share and I shared what I always want to do with my life. And, and it's be an MMA fighter. He goes, and then the very next day you guys are here, an MMA fighter, a boxing coach, another guy all in recovery. And he goes, this is just, this is just awesome. And I go, and I go, you did that yesterday. He goes, yeah. I go, let me tell you about my yesterday. So that was Friday. I told him about this guy, Chris in his story. And I'm like, I finally got to meet the guy and I got to hug him and I got to share with him. And he sent me his picture with his one month chip. So I'm, I'm leaving. And it was an awesome time at the treatment center, but there was a videographer there and they had us mic'd up and it was for the treatment center promotion for them. And, uh, he said, Hey, we're talking about synchronicities and yesterday. Can I tell you about my day yesterday? I'm like, well, yeah, of course, man, go ahead. His name's Jason. And Jason goes, yesterday I got hired by a dentist. And he specifically wants to find guys in recovery and fix their smiles. Whoa. Yeah. And I'm like, what? He goes, can I reach out to this guy, uh, to the dentist for Chris? So it was a couple of days ago. Uh, this is like back to back to back to back days. He calls the dentist. They're working on it. All of a sudden they're like, Hey, as early as this Saturday, we can give Chris a new smile. Damn. I'm like, what? Like things like that just blow me away. Yeah, no, it should. Yeah. That's yeah. a pretty divine intervention vibes. For yeah, man. sure. I mean, he's, he's going to be getting a new smile. Um, you know, and what I didn't share was when I, he, he asked if I could send him the pictures we took together. And so I sent him like three or four of them. And his first thing was like, man, I'm so excited to meet you. Thank you. Can you send me the pictures, send him the pictures first response. I'm so grateful for these photos. The only thing I'm ashamed about is my teeth. And I just told him like, Hey, that's small potatoes, man. Like you're here all that next day. I meet the guys with, uh, the, that knows the dentist the next day, the dentist hears about it. And the next day the dentist says, yes, I'm in, let's do it Saturday. So we're figuring out a way to plan it out. And hopefully we get to surprise him where it's like, Hey, I want to meet with you. Cause he's, I told him like, Hey, let's get together soon. He's like, Oh man, I'm, I'm excited. Let's do this. And I just want to have him sit there. Oh, dude, he's going to lose his shit. Yeah. I'm going to say, Hey, I've, 
you know, you told me about your teeth, all this stuff, but I want to introduce you to someone. I haven't even met the dentist yet, but have the dentist come out and shake his hand and say like, Hey, we're giving you a new smile. You know, I, I think, I think that, you know, what is it like to have teeth and then all of a sudden lose them? Right. Yeah. And, um, you know, his smile might be better than before. Yeah. I mean that, a, a, a good smile will give people confidence. And I've got this tattoo of this, uh, a real human skull on my, my arm. It's memento mori with the rose that I just got to yesterday. And that thing's purposely missing a couple of teeth in the front. Yeah. Cause in this life we're going to, we're going to take some licks. We yeah. might lose some teeth along the way. You could leave life right now. Yeah. And so I'm quite obsessed with that reason. I'm actually writing a uh, concept album on memento mori. Yeah. That will be the title of the next record. What does it mean to you? So, so I guess we should set the stage for listeners because uh, for me, memento mori, the three symbols is the hourglass, the skull, and the rose. The hourglass meaning time. Life is short. Time is limited. The skull, you're going to die. And then the rose. So let's make it something beautiful. But to you, what does this mean? Well, dude, when I was in ceremony, I had that coin in my hand the whole time. Yeah. You know, yeah. I was like obsessed with it. Yeah. I had to have it on me. And now I carry one. I carry one with me at all times. Um, yeah. To me, that thing that facing of the mortality, I think the the greatest misconception of our human existence is that we have all of this time. And I'm like, I don't know if we do. So I always keep mine on me. Um, I love that. It, and it sounds so morbid. I'll have to play. I'll have to send you. I recorded a demo version of the title track of Memento Mori and I'll send it to you. Great. But that phrase, remember you will die yeah. is so exciting to me mm. because I'm like, oh yeah. Like that's coming for all of us. Yeah. So what do I want to do with my precious time? Mm. And what am I going to think about when that time is coming? Mm. I'm going to think about how I lived. That's all you'll think about. Yeah. So to me, remembering my mortality will make me live in a way that when I'm sitting in that chair and that time is coming, that I can look back on the movie that I lived and be like, that was a good movie. Yeah. I did that right. You know, and that most of the shit that we, we chase after as humans, isn't it? You know, for yeah. me, I, if you would ask me three years ago, like you could be as big as you want to be music in in music at the cost of your relationship, I would have said, yes, that's, that's the life that I chose. Right. I chose music. And now I'm like, dude, if it doesn't involve reaching over in the middle of the night and feeling my wife's hand, not interested. Wow. If uh, it doesn't involve. That's a big perspective shift. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it was really COVID, man. It was like being home and I didn't have an identity out of Satsung for like five years. It was all I was focused on. It's all I talked about, you know. And when I started going to therapy, my first therapy session, the therapist goes, tell me about you. And she let me go, you know, she just let me keep talking and she goes, well, that's interesting. So your life started when you were 25. Wow. I started, I started my life story at Satsung starting. And that's when you were in the mountains. Yeah. Himalayas. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I was like, well, I got back from Nepal and then I started writing these songs and then boom, that was like, she's like, man, that's crazy. You didn't say anything about the rest of your life or anyone else in it. It It's just this band. Mm. Um, so I really you know, with her help, with that therapist's help and my wife's help, I really was like, okay, well, who am I outside of music? And then I realized all of these things that are so much more important than music to me, being a father, mm. being a partner, mm. um, that I love martial arts as much as I love music and I can't hide that or be ashamed of it. And then I have to, it's just real, dude. It just is what be it is. It, I just have to be who I am. And Satsung is a part of that. It's not all of it. You know, yeah. it's like, the person that I am when I'm writing those songs is a sliver on the pie chart of who I am. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And that that's what makes this whole thing beautiful. You're out there bailing hay. Mm -hmm. in God, man, what a rough couple of weeks that was. <laughs> we had peak week for our fighters. So I hadn't really left Montana this summer. Yeah. I think I went to Denver maybe a couple of times, um, but I hadn't left Montana a long time. So I was helping bail hay for a week and then training with our guys super hard. Cause it was like peak week for their camps, you know? And then, went to New York city and was like, Oh shit. You know? So I was doing all the Montana things. Like if someone was waiting across the street, I'd stop and like wave them on and someone would give me the finger and I'd be like, Oh no, you guys don't do <laughs> that. Here. Montana, I'm yeah. waving at everyone when I drive by <laughs> and they're like, who the fuck is that guy? You know? Um, so it's like, I just, I'm just now, I've never been more in tune with, with who I am and what I'm about. 
But I think that, I think that's so good. But I also think while you're saying all this, I was like, you're one of the most interesting, interesting dudes to me. That makes me like happy. one of the most interesting guys I've ever known because you live in the mountains and you chose that life. Yeah. Well, every day. Um, yeah. And you also have such self-awareness you can be like, you know what? Three years ago, I would have chose this, mm -hmm. but I'm so grateful that I didn't because now I'm here and I realize the most important thing is reaching over, filling summer's hand. Yeah. And, um, man, whenever you said earlier about, um, you know, playing that movie back at the end of our life, that thought, I just connected it. That's what actually took me to the Congo the first time or to the pygmy people because I had this big vision I did, I, and, and then I heard about how dangerous it was. And I was like, oh, I'm not going there. And I had no plans to go to Africa ever, except for maybe a safari, but uh, never to do any sort of humanitarian work. Yeah. It was all about me and about fighting. That's where my identity was wrapped up mm -hmm. in. And if I wasn't a fighter, who was I? And uh, maybe you felt that with being in music. Yeah, right? yeah, there's so many parallels between those two career choices. Right. It's like, nope, everything's about me and this forward movement in this yeah. career. But I knew at the end of my life, if I didn't go, even though it was dangerous, I had a guy that was willing to take me, um, who was a father, who was a husband and said, let's go. If you had a vision, let's go. And the question that was going to haunt me is what if, what could have happened, what should have happened, what would have happened? Um, what if, you know? And that would have just been playing over and over in my head. I just reached in my fanny pack. Uh, you reached into yours for uh, one of these Ryan Holiday uh, Daily Stoic uh, coins. Which one you got? Today, I have Summum Bonum. Summum Bonum is just that you do the right, uh, just that you do the right thing. The rest doesn't matter. So basically, if you're dying or busy, cold or warm, tired or well rested, despised or honored, you know, um, that you just do the next right thing. And if that's kind of your compass, I mean, that's, that's a good one. Yeah. I mean, and it's really easy cause I think we can zoom too far in or too far out. Yeah. And that's why I love all the stoicism stuff for that reason is it really simplifies it. It's mm. like, yeah, do the next right thing. Keep that mortality in the back of your mind and keep everything in front of you. Right. Our entire human lot should be before, mm. you know, and it's like, Malorum. yeah. So it's this thing of like, these basic little reminders of like, Oh, I feel lost. I feel lost. It's like, well, maybe just do the right thing today then and make that your goal. Yeah. You know, well, in sobriety, right. You mm -hmm. and I both have, have, uh, been to treatment. Mm -hmm. When did you go? 2010? Yep. Something like that. Mm -hmm. And so more than 10 years ago mm -hmm. and you haven't drank for something like eight years. Yeah. Eight something and a like half that. or yeah, something like eight that. Eight and a half. Wow. So if, if I get too far ahead, for me personally, right? If I think way too far down the line, I might get anxious. Yeah. I normally don't, but but I might get anxious thinking too far ahead. I got to do this, this, that, that. And then if I'm living in regret of the past, like that takes me out of this present moment. Yes. But if I just some focus on what do I got to do today? Do the right thing. Next 24 hours, right off the big book or, yeah. uh, or the 12 steps, like just the next one day 24 hours. Yeah, yeah. One day at a time. What was your sobriety journey like or, or recovery journey? I would say like, because it was, was, it was more drinking and maybe cocaine. Is that yeah, right? Yeah. And I feel like really, I feel like cocaine was just like a tool to keep drinking. You know, oh, okay. You could be like, oh man, I'm too drunk. I'm way too drunk. And we're like, okay, cool. That just erased like seven drinks. I've been there. Yeah. Um, for me, it was, God, it's, it's so weird to think about. Like I had zero, I think of so many times where I was told by someone close to me, like, Hey man, I need you to not get drunk today for this reason. And be like, yeah, man, got you but there was no like control over the decision to do it. It was like, well, man, I kind of have to, you know? Um, and I just couldn't shake it, man. And I went to rehab and I got a lot from that really just was that in Montana. Yeah. And really just dry, diving into the, to the 12 steps, um, was really helpful for me. It just gave me kind of a, a more philosophical look at my life and how re addiction related to it, you know? But I relapsed soon after rehab because I convinced myself like, no, maybe it was just Coke. That's the problem. You're fine. You know, I did the thing where I got out and I got a job and then got a car and was like, okay. 
have this back, you know? And I remember a guy from rehab coming to visit me at work because he had heard that I had relapsed. And he was like, hey, man, you know, I'm like 30 years older than you. I can tell you how this plays out, man. Like, he's like, I've done this like six times mm -hmm. where I get out, I get a job, get a car, get an apartment. And I'm like, okay, cool. I got everything back. I'm going to start drinking again. He's like, you'll lose everything, man. Mm -hmm. Um, but for me, you know, it was this like these three month periods usually where I'd be sober and then I'd fall off for a few days and then I'd be sober for a few days. I was really white knuckling the whole thing. And then me personally, I had a psilocybin experience that was really, really profound by myself. Um, and then I just realized in that experience, like, oh man, I'm like a really wounded guy. Like there's mm. something behind this compulsion to drink and it is really a compulsion to not feel or process. Yeah. Um, so it just kind of cracked me wide open. And then, you know, I always say that my first year or so of recovery was just hiding outside. It was hiking, it was rock climbing, it was fishing by myself. I just ran to the mountains and I didn't really have any friends because I didn't feel comfortable be around people that drank. Yeah. If you live in a mountain town and you're fly fishing and climbing and doing all those things, like drinking is a part of that culture, you know? So I did a lot by myself, man. And then the big test was, um, when I got back from Nepal, we went, I started touring, you know, playing three hour fucking bar gigs, you know, for really drunk people that didn't really care that I was there. And like, it was really taxing and demoralizing. And I started getting power from that. I'm like, man, if I can not drink during this shit, mm. like, I think I got it. And I really just haven't, I can only think of a couple of times where I've been close to being like, I might have a drink, but it just doesn't really come up, man. I feel like I, um, I built a life for myself that means so much to me mm. that I just don't think it could, it could fuck it up, you know? And then I have all of this music that holds me accountable. And I know there's a lot of artists out there that don't do that where they're like, yeah, no, well, I'm just kind of this vessel for this thing. So you can't hold me to the standard. Fuck that dude. I want to be held to that standard. I want, I want to be the guy that's walking when I'm talking, you know, that's really important to me that I am that person, you know? Mm. I've always liked, I don't know if this is a saying, but I've always had in my head that, um, you know, it's the person with the most reasons that usually wins. And if you can stack reasons, I mean, I'm, I'm, if I was a commentator for UFC night or Bellator night, I would study each fighter on the card and I'd be like, what reasons does this guy have? Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, I would look at their, their skill level, their, their record, who, the, who their camp is, all that stuff. But I think in the stare down, you can tell a lot of who's got it and who doesn't. Um, who, you know, who wants it the most. And I think what you're saying or can be helpful is whenever you're struggling with whatever it is to overcome that greatest challenge in your life, you got to stack up all the reasons why and remind mm -hmm. yourself, you know, you want to be held to a higher standard. So you're raising the bar of necessity to why. Yeah. Um, and you've got some, or you got the kids, um, you got all your fans. Um, you know, that's a great reminder to me, even, even that talk from that guy that had, you know, 30 was 30 years older than you, because even for me, it's a great reminder that, Hey, I've got Amy, her two girls that I love. I'm starting this podcast. I have a nonprofit, uh, that that's done more incredible things than I ever thought possible in the last 10 years. Well, and, and one thing yeah. that I don't think, you know, dude is, or maybe you do, is just how many people really fucking love you, man. Mm. You know? Um, that last little episode, dude, there was a network of us that were just like, where is he? Who's flying? Where, where are we grabbing this motherfucker? You know? Yeah. And, and it's like, that's such a powerful thing, man, to have, um, that many people that care about you yeah. and not care about you because you're Justin Wren with fight for the forgotten, but because right. you're Justin, our friend that we really dearly love, you know? Yeah. And that, um, to me, that is success, right? Like, I think we all, I think we all have this skewed, uh, version of what success is because we're equating, uh, monetary currency is the currency. And I always say happiness is the currency. Yeah. Love is the currency. And it's like, dude, if you have all of that, 
you know, I don't want one without the other. Like, you yeah. know, money's cool, but unless I'm super happy and full of love that the money probably won't do much good. One of the richest guys I've ever known uh, is one of the best men I've ever known. Doesn't always happen the way, but uh, he asked me something point blank. He's in his eighties. His name's Roger Almond. If you ever see the construction lights, uh, almond lights that are the yellow and black, now they have white and black, they have different colors. And if you're driving by a construction scene at night and there's like four or five or six big lights, it's most likely theirs. But Roger said, um, Justin, you got to, he was helping me with like a life vision, a life plan. And he was just giving me this. He was, he was a donor of ours, but he also said like, I want to help you. Mm -hmm. Like I, don't want to help the organization, not help you. I want to help you, but we're help the organization. We're both at the same time. I was like, wow, thank you. And, um, they've been great donors of ours, but they said, uh, he asked me, he goes, what's more important to you? Do you want to be successful? Do you, or what's more important success or significance? And I had to think about it for a minute because everyone is taught like be, be a success. And then he's like, do you want a successful life or a significant life? And he goes, you can have both, but which one is more important to you will most likely tell you the way your life's going to play out. He said, because he's seen some of the most successful in the world's eyes, people live the most insignificant lives because they decided not to make an impact. It was all about them. They became selfish. Mm -hmm. They had all the stuff, but they didn't have really any body that loved them for who they were, just what they had. Yeah. And yeah. that's the shit. Like we were just saying to bring a full circle when you were that dude and you were dying. Yeah. That is what you will think about. Yeah. This podcast is brought to you by on it on it.com slash overcome for 10% off. I've taken my alpha brain. You can probably hear it. <laughs> <laughs> you can probably hear it it's in powerful. my voice. Is it powerful? Normally yeah. I'm soft spoken. All right, here we go. The alpha brain is working. It's kick started. <laughs> I am in that flow state. It got me there faster. It keeps me there longer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Alpha brain. Thank you <laughs> on it. And thank you to the listeners of the show for supporting an easy way for you to support is go get you a free trial. There's a free trial for you waiting for you at on it.com slash free tri overcome. trials if they want. They can. Yeah. yeah. For total human, total human for me is the easiest supplement pack that I could ever think of. Well, can I just get personal for a second? Yeah. Yeah. You know, you're not known for your organization <laughs> skills. Okay. Uh, I'm not saying they're terrible or anything, but well, I'm not you're Miss Rockstar Amy Edwards. Well, I'm but yes. I'm, I'm overly known... organized, yes. But for you, yes. this is is great. So if someone so experiences great. like, oh my gosh, I have all these bottles are scattered around it somewhere literally in my backpack. Simplifies yeah. everything. For me, Taking eight to 10 to 12 supplement bottles on the road. I used to put it, I, I, maybe I could have a carry on some of the times, but if I'm going to compete and train, I always have to have a check bag and half of one side, or at least half of one side of my bag would be supplement bottles. I'm an organized person too. And even for me, it's a pain. Like yeah. I don't, I don't enjoy I've doing it. Tried, These packs are genius. I've tried yeah. every kind of pill. You and I have both done the pill boxes and they're just not enough space. Uh -uh. Um, and so maybe we should come up with one of those, well, <laughs> Yeah, but, uh, it's, <clears throat> it really simplifies everything where you have a, a morning support and a night support pack. You get an inspirational quote on there. You don't have to think about it. You just open it, take it. You got everything you need. And, uh, I absolutely love total human. And then, yeah, the alpha brain, the new mood, new mood's great at night. You can take it any time of the day. I enjoy taking it at night after a long day, I've been charged up by alpha brain. And then I take new mood at night and there's free trials. I like that. Okay. Yeah. yeah I, li I like it because it helps me relax. Oh, nice. Just kind of takes right. the day, and then what the about stress the of the day away. Shroom, shroom tech, tech is incredible. If you do shroom tech immune support, they have sport. Uh, I think they have a normal one, but shroom tech immune, I like to pair it with the Virotech. And the reason is because they help your immune system in different ways. But shroom tech is the all natural way to get the chaga, the reishi mushrooms, um, the cordyceps, the lion's mane. I think it's all in there for the immune, but they also are in there for the, for sport. So please go out and try your free trial at overcome.com or ohanit.com slash overcome for 10% off. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for supporting the show on it. And thank you listeners. 
let's return to the show with Drew Sat Sung, an amazing man, human being, and one of my best friends. Man, for me, I think Psychology 101 says you brought something up, and it was, um, I think Psychology 101 says the path to happiness, maybe a better word is joy, fulfillment, but but happiness, right? It's that you're, um, they have purpose is the first one, I think, purpose. Then that you're making personal progress is the second one. And then third is that you have community or quality relationships. Mm-hmm. And man, uh, this last year or two, I've had community that I've shoved out in my, my addiction. I have a pattern of doing that. Mm -hmm. You felt that. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think that I've been so reminded of, man, I have quality people in my life that love me, um, that are going to bat for me. And I have to look back at my purpose and make personal, personal progress and just be like, I'm going to do this this time. And I'm gonna do it the right way, or at least as often as I can. And when I mess up or slip up, like I'm, I'm down for the count, much less time, you know, yeah. quicker time to get up and, uh, and I'm, I'm, it's more sustainable a lot longer. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, that's the big thing. Mistakes are always going to happen. You're always going to act unfavorably or respond unfavorably. The key is what do you do? Mm. You know, like for me, the significance on the sobriety birthday, I feel like is kind of a curse for people. Cause I've met a lot of people that'll have like seven years yeah. and they relapse once. And then they're like, well, I just fucked up seven years. It's like, no, you didn't dude. You fucked up seven hours. Mm. Like you can hop right back on this train yeah. and, and, and look back and be like, in the last 30 years, I drank one time, Yeah, you know? And, and I think that's so important that it's like, no, well, you're a human dude. We do, we get caught up in our monkey mind and we, and we do dumb shit. Yeah. The key is going, okay, I just did some dumb shit. I'm going to make a note of that. And I'm going to try to mitigate as much of that dumb shit as I can. So I do not do it again. You know, right? that's Ra- really good, man. Yeah. Rather than just being like, oh my God, I messed up all of this stuff. And it's like, no, you didn't, man. Yeah. You know, you had a slip up like that happens. You know, what do you, what do you think about? That's really, really good. What do you think about? Because I am so appreciative of treatment. Mm-hmm. I'm so appreciative of sober living. Yeah. And I'm appreciative of, uh, I'm really grateful for the 12 steps. I've been through it once. Currently I'm going through the fourth step right now. And that that's probably the hardest, yeah, hardest thinking thing in the fifth, but, uh, the taking the personal inventory, looking at all the areas you fell. Seven's a humdinger too. Yeah. Yeah. Reaching out to a bunch of people you fucked over and I did a right. lot yeah. of that, you know? Yeah. 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 Making amends eight. Yeah. Yes. Eight. Yeah. yeah. And, but what would you say? Some of those meetings they it, they always talk about sharing your experience, strength hope, and, and hope, strength yeah. and hope. And but sometimes they feel a little bit like there's not a lot of there's a lot of experience, but maybe not a lot of, a lot of strength and hope. Yeah, that was the rooms. That was my experience, which is why I, I kind of left AA. And I think the the stats don't lie, man. The approach of the twelve steps in those meetings is more effective than any other process that there is for addiction. Right. But for me, since I was a little kid, I always knew like, you know, I remember seeing people in suit and ties and being like, Nope, that ain't for me. You know, I'm going to fucking ride motorcycles and play fenders and anything that wasn't normal, anything that related to the counterculture I was interested in because I knew I wanted to live an unorthodox life. And I found myself in AA seeing people that just didn't seem real happy that had 30 some years of sobriety and that sobriety became the mainstay of their personality Hmm. where it's like, man, I feel like for the first little bit, that's good because you really need to focus on that while it's fresh. But eventually you have to move on with your life and be like, okay, this is always going to be a part of me, but it's not the whole me. Yeah. It's not a crutch. Yeah. It's not a crutch, you know? And I just, I, I hate victimhood and I hate, um, excuses. And for me, I would see so many people going in there and just kind of bitching about their day. Mm -hmm. And then the end wrap up would be like, but I didn't drink. So I got that. And I'm like, man, I just want to live so much more yeah, life, life than that. You know, like I want to be like life giving and I'm not dogging on the meetings, but I think if you actually dig into the stats, I I might be slaughtering them here. If you just go to AA meetings, I think you only have like a five to 10% chance of sobriety. Mm -hmm. If you go to treatment that shoots up to like 25, 30, yeah, 25, yep. 30. Um, and then if you back it with sober living, you can sh- 
sh- shoot up to like 60 to 80% yeah. range, depending on what kind of house you're in. So you, you stack those things. But I think if you actually look at the big book and those first hundred guys, those thousands of people that I think of the first hundred, like 96 stayed sober for the rest of their lives. Mm-hmm. And that was because they were literally rigorously, honestly, uh, willing to go to any length, uh, for, for the 12 steps, which that's a principle of life. Well, dude, and think right? about the relief yeah. of, I think when you have an addiction, mo- the name of the game is hiding it Yeah, because you don't want anyone to know that you're an addict. So the power and just getting in a room with a bunch of other addicts and being able to be like, Oh shit. Hey, my name's drew. I am an alcoholic Yeah, and here's all the fuck shit I've done. And to have a bunch of people look back at you and be like, same. I know that one. It's so heart opening where you can just be like, Oh my God. Okay. So we can just talk about this here. Like this is a safe place to talk yeah. about all of the just yeah. gnarly shit that I've done because of my addiction. Um, so there's just raw power in that and, and previous, uh, or prior to, to AA, that just wasn't how it went. You know, it was like, alcoholism wasn't a thing that was talked about. It was just like, well, yeah, he drinks a lot, Mm -hmm. you know, and it's, it, and it's so sad to think that that was a world that existed where we didn't, weren't addressing. Cause how many alcoholics have you met that are just phenomenal human beings? And it's like, if they wouldn't, you know, that's all they needed was this little thing fixed. And now they can live to their highest potential. You know, like I think about that with me, I, I can't even believe that my life is my life. Mm. And can, can you give us a before and after kind of like, because I know before you, you shared a story once where when it all set in that I might be past the point of no return. Yeah. So I was living in Chicago and I was just kind of in a scene of, I don't think everyone was alcoholics, but we were all in our twenties and drank every day. That's what mm-hmm. we did. We all worked at the same shop. We all went to the same bar drink. And then on your days off, you drank all day. Like that was just what we did slowly, but surely people started graduating college or, you know, their relationships got serious. So they quit drinking as much, you know, and it was like, Oh, you weren't an alcoholic. You were just having a good time. And it became clear to me that everything was kind of changing in my friend group. So I decided to move to Colorado with some of my high school friends that were severe addicts. Mm. And I was just like, well, that'd be good company. Um, but I, I went out there, I was told that I had a job and a place to live. And, you know, my friend had pretty much told me like, I got you all set up. Well, I get out there, find out that I don't have a job, <laughs> um, that my place to live is there's a one bedroom apartment with him. And now two of us also living there. So I had floor space, uh, you know, not a room. So I have all of my, you know, like a van load of shit out with me in Colorado. And I think I had maybe like $800 saved and it was new year's weekend. Mm. So I spent all that money real quick. Um, and when I ran out of money, I remember I woke up and was like violently shaking. And I was like, what the fuck is this? Cause I had just never encountered, I had never yeah. encountered a time where I couldn't just go open a beer. Yeah. Um, so I was like violently shaking and was like, oh no, that was when it first hit me. Like you're sick. Yep. You are not, um, this isn't a party. This isn't fun. You're sick. Yeah. And I remember I went downstairs and knocked on this lady's door and was like, Hey, do you have any alcohol? And she was like, what? And I I think she saw me shaking, but she was like, hang on. And I don't remember what she grabbed something fruity and gross, Okay, you know, like a a four loco or just something gross. Yeah. Or no, it was UV blue. That like blue raspberry vodka, just syrup. I had that back in the day. And I chugged it, man. I just started. And like, within a minute, my hands steadied. And I was mm-hmm. like, Oh shit. And then it really set in of like, you're fucked, man. So I moved back to Chicago for a brief period of time. Cause I was selling drugs in Chicago. Well, just real quick for people that don't know about it, addiction, like alcohol withdrawals are some of the hardest to go through. Um, I actually, die. yeah. Oxy for me, like, man, I would, food would fall off the fork. I'd sweat through the bed. I'd f- almost, and, and they say they're the most, some of the most brutal to go through opiate. But if you stop heroin, oxy, those kind of things, cold turkey, you're not going to die. You'll feel like you're going to die. Yeah. You feel, you I thought I was at one point, but you actually can die getting off alcohol, just cold turkey. And I think barbiturates like Xanax. Yep. yep. But there's only two that will kill you, but not meth, not heroin, yeah. not some of these other crazy drugs. 
uh, not cocaine, but, but you were, you were experiencing the real deal. The very real deal. And I had no money. So I called my sister and I said, Hey, can I come back to Chicago? Because I was selling drugs in Chicago. So I was like, dude, I could land, call my guy, see like, yo, I'm back. Can I get some work? Yeah. Go back doing my thing, which is exactly what I did. I got off the plane, took a train to Rogers park, picked up some shit, went out, sold it. Boom. Just like that had money back in my pocket. So that was like a three week period of like couch surfing. And my sister was like, yo, dude, you can't be a drug dealer and live here. And she is an alcoholic who's since passed from her addiction. Sorry. But um, she was like, you have to have a real job if you're going to stay with me. Like you can't just be hustling. So I was like couch surfing with friends, friends that like to drink in the morning, you know, and friends yeah. that I could just give drugs to to stay there. And then I just realized I was, I was like tapped out. It was the first time in my life. I was like, this is the fucking end, man. Like you're not going to get an apartment. you can't keep enough money to, to get back on your feet. Cause you spend it the moment it comes in. Like this is it, man. So I went to my sister's house and, uh, told her, I was like, I think I'm just going to kill myself. Oof. She was like, you're not going to kill yourself. And I was like, no, I'm pretty sure that I am. And she's like, no, you're not. And I pulled a knife out of her drawer and was just like, Wham! and kind of, I don't think I was trying to kill myself, but I was trying to prove a point. And right after I did it, I was like, oh shit. You know, it was like open lips cut, yeah. like blood pouring out of my arm. And I was like, oh shit. So she calls a couple of our close friends was like, yo, interventions happening right now. So we get like a towel in there, tape it. And then I, it's so kind of blurry, yeah. but I remember by the time we had like treated and handled the wound, I was like sitting there and there was like seven close friends that I used to be really tight with that had since kind of cut me off. Right. And I remember my friend Rob crying and he is this big, huge Irish born fella, not a crier. Yeah. And he was crying and he was like, we're, it's done, man. Like it's time. And my dad was uh, a higher up at a treatment facility in Billings. So I was cool. like, okay, this is cool. How can I milk this situation? I said, Jay, I'll agree to go to rehab if you buy me two grams of cocaine. She was like, done. That's totally fair. So <laughs> you were negotiating yeah. to go to treatment. Yeah. Just give me some more drugs. Yeah. That's pretty much every story I, I heard. Uh, uh, I mean, like similar, like one, one more, one last time. You yeah. Know? Yeah. One last I'll round. go, but just one, one, one more time. I figured this would be a process to get me in. I figured yeah. I'd have a week, uh -huh. you know, or something. And my mom calls me and she's hysterically crying. And she's like, your flight leaves tomorrow at 8 a.m. It was like nine o'clock at night, you know? And I was like, no. No, no, no. Can we do like Friday? You know, can I have yeah. a few days? And my ex-girlfriend came over to say goodbye to me. And um, it was just this whole scene and it happened really fast. And I didn't go to bed that night. And no, with two grams of cocaine. No, definitely, <laughs> no, definitely not going to sleep on that. And it was just such a, it was such a wild thing. And it was just like this dream happened. And then I was in treatment. And I remember, um, I remember I, when I detox, you know, they give me volume so I wouldn't die. Mm. And I remember they did my blood. And I remember this nurse who was friends with my dad. I saw her talking to my dad and she was crying. The nurse, the nurse was crying. And I was like, kind of, you know, I was feeling the volume and I was kind of being a dickhead. And I had, was sitting in this wheelchair and I like wheeled over to her and I was like, what are you crying about? She's like, your liver enzyme count is like what we see when someone is like, in their sixties or seventies and has been drinking their whole life. And it's like, has psoriasis. I was like, Oh, oh shit. She's like, you would have died. Like in the next couple of years would have been dead. And I was like, Oh fuck. <laughs> so I guess we made the right call, you know, yeah. here I am. Um, so it's so crazy. It's just so crazy. And, and I think of like, what if that would have been the end of the story? Mm that a kid drank himself to death before his 30th birthday. And I could have been me. I could have been Satsung. I could have been a dad. I think, I think that's the the thing that, um, Amy had a guest in here, uh, Garen, that he's incredible, Garen Jones. And I've heard less, uh, less Brown, uh, motivational speaker say this. And, you know, one of the most haunting things at the end of your life is, 
the ghost of everything you could have brought into existence, the ideas, the dreams, uh, the impact you could have made. And those things have to die with you. Mm-hmm. And they could have died with you before your 30th birthday. Yeah. But now they're not. No. And that's the only, that's where I live from now. Yeah. Is that's why I'm so attached to my mortality is because mm-hmm. I'm like, man, how cool can we make this? How much joy can we bring? Yeah. How honest can we be? Like what's been one of mo- your most joyful moments then? Like either in your career or life or. Oh my gosh. Um, playing Red Rocks and seeing mm. my wife and Malachi dancing his little ass off <laughs> was up there. I How old's Malachi now? He's three, he's and, a half. three and a half. He is a unit, man. Yeah. He's got a full personality. And he's like, I'm starting to realize how many of my mannerisms he's picking up. He goes like this all the time. <laughs> um, That's but, him picking up his hands in his stance yeah, for fighting. Yeah. He, um, you know, the moment he was born, I caught him, you know, so I literally pulled him out of his mom. That was a million times more intense. It was like shot with a shotgun of every positive emotion you could feel of purpose, of love, of man, it just was so real. And so, you know, it wasn't assisted by any substance. It was, it was the purest, most primal feeling of love and joy and amazement. And I'd never cried tears of joy before. And I was bawling. I just couldn't believe that this was real, that I had like helped make this thing and that here he is. And, um, that, and then really dude, like the last six months of my life with my wife, we just been, we've just been so locked in and like, I just am loving her more every day and I just feel closer to her every day. So it's like, yeah, when I think of these moments, I think so much of her and just getting to be her dude. Um, yeah, she's just the best. Yeah. And here the uh, Amy pulled up a picture. She is uh basis says I am the luckiest dude in the world is what you finished with. Yeah, and it's funny so too cuz cuz I have a beautiful picture of her with Red Rocks behind her. Yeah. And I go, have this go to Sat Sung's uh Instagram. I have this this perspective too of all of my friends, you know. It's it's really hard as a touring musician to find a partner. Hmm. Because what'll happen is even if you meet someone on time off, you can explain till the tech cows come home, like, okay, well, I'm going to be gone a lot and it's going to be hard and you have to kind of have your own thing. It's different when you actually go, you know, um, and summer just is so graceful in her sharing of me. You know, she really is. She understands that I have this purpose yeah, and that for me to be me, I have to do that. She understands that for me to be me, I have to train You know, and if that means coming home with a broken nose or, you know, every ligament in my knee torn, like she's just like, well, this is part of his process. And I honor that process. Wow. You know, you think that comes from just, well, it's probably innately in her, but also from her being a therapist. Yeah. I think it's a lot of that. And I I think she just knows me so well and she knows I'm not doing anything unless it's to enhance who I am. Mm. So like, if I tell her like, Hey babe, I have to buy this motorcycle and I have to drive it really, really fast. (laughs) You know, most wives would be like, no, I don't want you to die. And she's just like, well, if this is part of your process, then like, I guess get the bike. You know, she just really honors my walk because she knows I'm not doing anything just to fucking do it. You know, she knows that I'm like trying to put together this puzzle. Um, that's me. Hmm. You know, she knows that that's my goal is like, I'm trying to live my life in a way that our great, great grandkids talk about me. Yeah, <laughs> You know what I mean? Yeah, They'll be playing your music. I know it. Yeah. And, uh, and they'll be talking about the man that you are, but that imagery of, I'm just trying to put this puzzle together. That is me. They're put the pieces of the puzzle together mm-hmm. that are me. That's, that's actually beautiful because I've been on that journey, but I never thought of it that way. You know, let me add this in. Mm -hmm. This is awesome. Let me do this. Mm -hmm. This, I'm going to explore it because I think it could add benefit to my life. And you take what works and you throw out what doesn't. Yeah. And sometimes you think it's, um, 
yeah, you think something is going to be a pivotal piece of the puzzle and it turns out it isn't. And then, yeah, you just take it out and you start looking for the other thing, you know, like, yeah, for me, the motorcycle is the most recent thing, you know, where I was like, babe, I'm going to buy this motorcycle. And she's like, no, you know, we're like saving for a house. Here's like four logical reasons why you shouldn't buy a motorcycle. And I said, baby, the motorcycle isn't a, a, a toy to me. Like it's this piece of who I I'm, I'm constantly looking at my life as like, would 16 year old me be like, fuck yeah, bud, you're doing exactly what you said you were going to do. Hmm. And to me, a motorcycle is a huge part of that thing that I want it to be. Do you, do you ever ask? That's awesome. I love that. I wonder if there's another side of it. Do you ever ask, is this what the 60 year old me would be saying? Fuck yeah. You should have done yeah. this. Yeah, man. Rumble, young man, rumble. I think you just have this like, um, this finite time yeah. where you're like handsome and able-bodied and like filled up with passion and energy. Mm-hmm. And it's like, dude, you got to take advantage of that. You know, like there was a, uh, I forget who it was, but I read this thing one time that was like, man, society has this backwards. Your retirement should be that like 21 to 35. And then you should work when you're older, you know, it's like you should be getting to do whatever you want in the prime of your life, you know? Um, yeah. But, but for me, I just am like, yeah, dude, buy the bike, take the punch, kiss the girl, write the song, like do all of the things that fill up your heart, you know? And for me, I just see this image of, of who I am and what I want to be in these things that are pivotal pieces of, of that. And, and at the end of the day, it's love and freedom. Like mm. th- those are my pillars. Those are the the lines that, that I try to stay between is love and freedom. I love that. You, you, uh, I've heard you talk about addiction being slavery. Yeah. And then, and you don't even know that you're in it. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, and it's such a funny thing of like, you're in it and you're like, okay, I'm completely relying upon this substance to feel what I think is how I want to feel. And like I said, you just don't even know that on the other side of that, if you can handle this one little thing on the other side of that is your actual potential. Yeah. So yeah, you're a slave to this thing, but you don't even know you're a slave to it because you've normalized it. It's like, no, it's normal for me to drink all day, every day, because this is just what I do. Yeah. Yesterday I was sent a message um, I from that same treatment center that I shared at. I got a, a message from one of the clients. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because um, you know, we we're just talking about it, uh, with addiction being slavery and then freedom. But I think what you laid out love and freedom, like, I think love is the path to that freedom because mm-hmm. this guy said to Justin Renee K the Viking, I'd like uh, to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to come share your story with us. I wanted you to know that you had have made a lasting impact on me, not only in recovery, but my life. I can never thank you enough for how, how, uh, thank you enough. I can never thank you enough. There's some typos or show you how much of a difference you made by sharing your story. It really hit home for me. It's easy for me to love everyone else, but the hardest thing to do is to be able to look in the mirror and love who I see by telling your story. It made me realize I need to work on loving and caring about myself before I can ever truly move forward in my recovery and be the man that I know I can be. I wanted you to know you made a difference in one person's life just by coming in and sharing your story. I'll never forget it and forever be indebted to you. Thank you. And, uh, that was James. I owe him a book. Uh, it's a book that Amy gave me. It's, uh, love yourself. Like your life depends on it. And Amy's been really great at reminding me, love yourself. Like your life depends on it. Kamal Ravikant. Yeah. Yeah. Because it does. Mm Mm-hmm. That's how she has said it to me. And it's like, wow. Um, and whenever he asked this question, his hands were shaking and his lip was quivering and his eyes were already welling up in tears. And uh, he asked me a question and I'm trying to remember what it was, but basically the answer I had was love yourself like your life depends on it, brother. And I know that's our biggest struggle. I'm not just pointing that out to you. It's, it's, it's my biggest struggle, but man, that's the path. That's the path. to Yeah. And it's, and that's, what's so hard with addiction is because when you do, when you're in your addiction, you do so many unfavorable things that are out of character. Mm -hmm. 
So you're, you have this laundry list of reasons why you shouldn't love yourself. Yeah. And the only antidote to that is to start accumulating things and reasons to love yourself. Mm. Well, I didn't fucking drink today. Okay. So there's, there's a good one. I held the door for that person. Okay. There's another, like, you got to start small, do the next right thing. That's all that matters, you know? And, and we're so caught up in time is there's this, we want such immediate results. And like, Mm. that was a hard thing for me early in recovery was, I was like, man, am I ever going to not feel like this? Why I'm just like white knuckling and just like, okay, just don't drink, don't drink. And it's like, yeah, dude, but it takes time. Mm. It takes a year, sometimes two, sometimes three, you know, where it's this, it eventually becomes a moot point, but it takes a long time for it to get there because it has to be that 24 hours at a time. And then maybe it moves to a week at a time and then a month at a time. And then it's just not even a thing you think about anymore, but it's so hard in that early phase. We're like, well, I don't have anything currently to love myself for, you know, and, and a huge yeah. part of rehab, right. Is taking that inventory of like the yeah. wrongs that you've done. So you're mm-hmm. really swimming in all yeah. of the shit, you know? And it's like, you know, what I would say to him or anyone in that position, it's like, well, at least you're here. Dude. Yeah. At least you've started the work. Most right. people don't start the work at all. They don't start it. And after they do, like you can stop. And one of your songs, one of the best things you said, I think it was in between, right? The work is never done. Mm-hmm. The work is never done, but let's get started. Well, what a silly thing to, to think that it is. Like, I, I couldn't imagine being like, no, dude, I'm perfect. I have nothing to work on. I'm, um, I'm actually better at jujitsu than everyone on the planet. Uh, I'm the kindest, most, I sound like Donald Trump right now, (laughs) Um, but like, you know, like that's just not, uh, there's always something we can be chipping away at. And in that process is what makes you proud of yourself. What makes Mm. you love yourself is like, no man, you know, this is my focus right now. This is what I'm working on. Yeah. You know, huge thing for me post ceremony is my kids um, and how I'm connecting with them individually. And realizing like, oh man, what do I want my relationship with them to be like when they're adults and out in the world? I want to be their friend. You know, I want to be the person that they call when they're doing something. So I like, that's been my big focus recently is like. When you say post ceremony for people that don't know, what does that mean? um, I did an ayahuasca ceremony um, early in the summer and it was extremely profound for me. Um, It it was weird. I'm one of like three people that I've ever met that didn't purge. I had some scary moments in it, but really it was like, I felt like spirit saying like, you're doing it, man. You were fucking doing it. What was there with you? Yeah. Right next to me. uh, I was right next to you. (laughs) Um, and wow. Yeah. I remember that you sharing that, uh, you just got a, almost an attaboy. Yeah. You know, just yeah. Keep doing what you're doing. Yeah. And it was like, the big thing was like the, the only, um, I guess negative, like self worky yeah. part of it was I was like shown this love and this glorious thing of like, Oh, this is where we come from. This is our nature. This is where we're going when we're done. Mm. And then she was like, why do you keep forgetting? And I was like, I do. I forget all the time. <laughs> And she was like, do you promise to remember? And then I like rolled over on my back. I was like, I swear. And she's like, okay, cool. You're good then. Like (laughs) we say she like ayahuasca. Yeah. 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 And then, and then night two was, was her showing me music and my kids and, and all of these things. And then like little glimpses of my past life and almost where I would have been if I wouldn't have straightened out. And I just had this like, I mean, dude, to go into that space and be ready for um, thrashing and get a back rub and be like, no, dude, you were on the path. You were doing mm-hmm. it. Just keep doing what you're doing, man. Yeah. A little easier on the kids. A little easier on the kids. Yeah. Yeah. I remember that. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. That's so good. Uh, you didn't purge. Mm-mm. You sure did. I sure did. I sure, <laughs> I sure did. I was thinking that. I was wondering how to say it. I think I puked up my toenails. Yeah. Uh, and then I remember I would go, yes. Healing. Healing. After <laughs> oh, healing. Yeah. I remember oh, a very. Uh, freedom. I remember a really hilarious moment where I was like, had my hand on the back of your head. And I was like, yeah, man. Cause I wasn't really in it yet. Yeah. And then all of a sudden I was like, what is my hand on? And I was like, you better lay down, bud. And I was like, all right, I love you. I'll see you later. See you later. 
Uh. Yeah. And it's, it's wild too. You know, I think, I think the reason those medicines can be so powerful and they're not for everyone, but I think yeah. the reason they can be so powerful is there's no hiding in there. Mm. You know, you can go through your life and like feed everyone the bullshit of what you're doing and what you're working on and all of that stuff. But in there, there's no hiding. So it's going to bring up whatever needs brought up, man. And, um, you know, the thing that really hit me about ayahuasca that makes it different is you look around the room and you can just go, nobody's here for a good time. Mm. You know, nobody came here to party. It's like everyone is here because they feel broken or they feel they're here to do work yeah, because they know that it needs tended to. Um, and to me, it, it wasn't even really the experience of what I had because it was so gentle and so affirming and very intense, but loving. It was hearing everyone else's stories, um, you know, seeing a beautiful young woman that was like, I don't even actually know if I want to be here anymore. I don't yeah. even think what I'm saying matters. Yeah. And to see a mechanic and a stay at home mom and soldiers and just all of these people from all of these different walks of life that felt broken, mm -hmm. that were seeking. And that's to me where it's at is in the seeking. Like if you're not out there looking to tend to your garden, like it's going to get sloppy. It's going to get messy. Yeah. So it's like, w dude, whether you're looking for that through jujitsu, through ceremony, through counseling, which this is something that I feel like, especially in the kind of new agey community that doesn't get enough credit. Had I not started going to psychotherapy, like a, a trauma informed psychotherapist that I could be like, oh yeah, I was severely physically abused from, you know, my earliest memory to 17 years old. And then outside of my house was also surrounded by violence to have someone approach you with the knowledge of like, oh, so your entire prefrontal cortex was formed under fear, you know, like mm. that psychotherapy with someone that knows what the fuck they're doing is so important, man. Like yeah. it's, it, it is more than psychedelics, more than jujitsu, more than anything that I've done. I, I give it a hundred percent credit for me being who I am right now. Yeah. Like I could not have done it without that professional help. And it's a, it's kind of a weird taboo thing for people to talk about Therapy. seeing a therapist. Yeah. yeah. A therapist. Dude, it, I, I get that too, because well, we're both martial artists. Yeah. Not many of the guys that we train with or spar against are going to therapist. Yeah. And, um, I mean, there's a lot of some of the best dudes in the world. I mean, you know, Rafael Lovato Jr. And yeah. so, so many others. We know Rashad. And yeah. some of these guys are the best dudes, uh, like some of the best dudes walking yeah. this earth. And, but I know that I got to a point where I was white knuckling it. Didn't understand because I had never asked for help with my addiction. Um, and I had so much purpose mm -hmm. through Fight for the Forgotten. Um, that it, it basically that love, that passion, that freedom I found in that kept me sober. Mm -hmm. But then all of a sudden when it wasn't, I think I felt so much shame, other things. I think I carried the weight of the burden that I didn't have to carry, but I decided to carry. Mm -hmm. I started this thing. Well, I think um, there's also a thing with your story, man, of like, you know, we were able in my therapy to trace back pretty much my personality to two events, which is no one's coming to fucking help me, man. I'm out here on my own. I'm an island. I don't fucking need anybody. I'm doing this alone. Everyone else is just kind of co-stars in this film mm -hmm. where it's like when you're bullied, those that pathology stays with you. Yeah. Of like, no, dude, I am a piece of shit. I'm not good enough. I'm yeah. actually this. And it's like. Everyone that knows you is like, no, you're not. That's not what you are at all. But there's still that inner voice that's like that scared, insecure kid, you know? And it's like, I think in all addiction, there's something behind it. Oh, yeah. You know, it's always, always a, abuse, always a trauma. There's always a root to it, you know? And like, the, yeah, that's something that I've always seen in you as I was just like, I, this is something I tell my wife all the time where I'm like, dude, if you could see yourself the way I see you, you would be a superhero. Hmm. You know, you would just be... You have no idea what I see when I look at you, you know? And I guess that's Thanks, also bro. kind of like the, the weird thing about this life is I don't see me the same way that you see me, you know, like, yeah. but it's like that, that digging deep and tracing those pathologies back to understand, you know, when we understand something, it isn't, you know, it's not as, 
it's not as crazy, right? Like when you hear that someone that bullied you was like, oh yeah, well, his dad used to put cigarettes out on him. You're like, mm. oh yeah. Now I don't, you know, now, now I can process that a little differently. Yeah. One of the, one of the biggest bullying moments that we kind of, um, intersected in, in fight for the forgotten that, that we, um, really start helping this, this, this young man, uh, one of the people that was bullying him relentlessly, you know, we wanted to love both sides, not just the one getting bullied, but the ones that were being the bullies. And we found out that one of their stories was that they watched their father kill their mother oh. and that they were living in a trailer with their grandparents without electricity. And it was like, whoa, that's a hurt kid. You know how, how much pain were they going through at 13 years old? Mm -hmm. um, and so it's that whole saying that hurt people hurt people. Yep. Every time. But man, uh, I think the opposite's true. Like loved people, love people. Yes. Free people, free people. Yep. Healed people, heal people. Yes. And, uh, and people that have been helped, if they recognize it and are grateful for it, helped people help people. Yeah. And so a lot of people um, have come and helped me along the way. You, Amy, so many of the people that are behind these cameras. Um, but so many more than that, my coaches, man, I have the, my mom is in my phone as best mom ever. I think I'm still alive because of her and I know it actually. And then, um, you know, we've had thousands of donors with uh, fight for the forgotten thousands and thousands that have made it possible from all 50 States Damn. and 60 different countries. Like this has become like a movement and I'm so incredibly grateful for that. And, and while I'm talking about fight for the forgotten, these overcomer stories are provided by, you know, empowered by fight for the forgotten and like, we'll, we'll continue to, to support, um, you know, Chris and his story. We'll cover that after he gets, you know, his new set of teeth and that happened. Uh, I get to tell you the story between the first and second podcast and who I knows, know, like, it. yeah, it's, it's awesome. But, but, um, anyways, uh, I think that there's a lot of, a lot of great things going on. We have our fight club that people can join at fight for the forgotten. Um, and then you have a new album out. Isn't that right? Yeah, man. It's the greatest thing I've ever made. Yeah. Next to Malachi. All right. Um, now. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> next to your son, the greatest thing you ever made. It's, um, it's really honest and I really love the way it sounds and it really felt like home. You know, it just really felt like home, like who I am right now. Mm. It is the most, um, you know, every other record had been made where I was writing songs while I was traveling or as things were coming up. And, and with COVID, I, I was finally left alone, man, to go back into the mountains and to just be with my wife and be a parent and, and, and fish and float the river and hike and climb and just do all the things that I did before music stole me. So it was like in this heart opening process of like going to therapy and realizing that I'm so much more than sad songs. So all of these songs that came out were just, they mean so much to me, every single one of them. And, um, it really brought us closer together as a band when we were making it, you know, we all hadn't seen each other in almost a year. And I flew everyone to Montana to make the record out there. It just seems really silly to make it anywhere else uh, than where all the songs were written. And it was just a really special process of, of getting all of the boys together and making this thing. And I'm so proud of it. And I love it so much. And it's the only record of ours that I listen to. Like, mm. I will put it on because I want to listen to mm. it. I've never had that before. Well, what it's this place. Uh, what's the title again of that song? The, this place. This place. Yeah. yeah with okay. Trev. It's not this place now. Yeah. That one's awesome. Uh, I love that. I listened to that this morning. What's one of your favorite songs from the album? Uh, uh, you're, you're getting on your 2021 fall tour. You're coming back to Austin, uh, December. 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 Yep. December. I'm there. Yeah. Please. Pretty please. Yes, of I'll course. Yeah. And, we, uh, and, and we're like, um, yeah, I think my favorite, I have so many favorite songs on there. I think, yeah, I can't pick one. Cause I have, uh, from, and I go mm. is just this love song to Montana and everything that makes me feel home. So my, my wife and Montana and, and just all of the things, 
Um, but all right now just really sums up, you know, the, the struggle of like, well, I'm a leader, but do I want to be a leader? Everyone is asking for these things from me. Mm. Oh, but it's all beautiful. What a blessing to be in this crazy seat where I, so much is asked of me, you know, yeah. and like, and really, um, settling into my role as the man that I've become. Um, and, uh, and so all right now is there, but I'm the one too, is just such a funny song. You know, I just remember so vividly that first summer uh, of summer and I being together, you know, I was working in a coffee shop and sleeping on a couch in an apartment and she had a master's degree and three kids and it, on paper, it didn't make sense at all, but we just loved each other so much. You know, yeah. we just couldn't stop. We just couldn't stop loving each other. And, um, yeah, every song on there I love. And then the song Malachi is super powerful. Yeah. I, I, I wrote that the night he was born, just staring at him on his mom's chest in the, in the hospital. And I wrote that down and didn't even know it was going to be a song. I just wrote this thing. So you'll notice the song doesn't really rhyme because it's just like this thing that I was writing while I was staring at him with his mom. Yeah, the whole record, it's all heart. There's yeah. just no, there's no head in there at all. It's all heart. Wow. How did y'all get Malachi's name? I, it, she said, I'm pregnant and she started crying and I said, we'll call him Malachi. And she goes, well, you don't, you don't know if he's going to be a boy. I said, we will call him Malachi. Wow. Yeah. Uh, which is, that's wild. I know. Yeah. It means God's messenger. Okay. And, uh, I just knew that it, he wasn't an accident and, um, I could have, I had always knew, we always knew he was coming cause summer was saying in meditation that a son was coming to her all the time. And I'm like, we are not having a kid. I'm like in the middle of building this thing that would be super inconvenient. And then I remember, uh, she came out on the road with us for a couple of weeks and we were on tour with Trevor Hall. And, and I remember the night he was conceived and it was very unlikely that he was to be conceived given, uh, the timing. And, um, out of nowhere, like a week later, Carl was like, do you think you're going to have any more kids? I was like, I don't think so. But if we did, I would be happy with him. Like, I just knew it was going to be a boy. Like I, it was so weird. Yeah, it was so weird. Like he was just supposed to arrive. He's a little stud too. Mm -hmm. Wow. He, yeah. Messenger. Yeah. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. So, Hopefully, so grateful for him. If he wants, uh, maybe we'll get some of the songwriting skills of pop or martial arts. Yeah. Kicks, I punches, wonder, I hope he doesn't want to be a do. fighter. Holy okay. cow. Um, but <laughs> Yeah, I uh he says stuff all of the time. You know, he's really into lifting things up right now mm -hmm. and show how strong he is. And he's like, Dad, I'm gonna get muscles so we can fight at the grindhouse. Like, okay, <laughs> good. That's um, awesome. What do you think of this, by the way? Man, uh, for people that aren't watching, I was delivered a gift from a guy in Boston, Massachusetts, Doug. And Doug brought me in a gift today, and Drew got to see him hand it off. How would you describe that? A, I've never seen that style of painting before, but I'm, um, I, I can't think of many people that I would be like, holy shit, man. But if Mike Tyson was standing in front of me, I could keep it together. But like when I was a kid, we always were watching HBO boxing. So my knowledge of like nineties boxing is so thick, especially that heavyweight division, yeah. you know? Um, and Mike Tyson, when I was a kid, I just, I was so infatuated with him and his story and the way he fought is it was like, like you remember in his prime it, what you weren't turning into watch a Mike Tyson fight. It was like, well, who's Mike knocking out? Yeah, There was, it wasn't, exactly. it wasn't Mike Tyson's that fight. Aura yes. he had. Like you can even see it in this, this picture of him whenever he's retired. I don't think he's fighting then. No. And, uh, this is a portrait of Mike. He's got the face tat. It's a black and white, but it's just like acrylic dots that he does. And then it's got a They're red like little spikes. Yeah. Yeah. It's actually texture you can feel. Well, he had this, I think the thing that was so powerful about him was his confidence. And you could see, you could see that everyone knew what was going to happen. Like you were talking about face-offs. Yeah. When they would bring Mike Tyson and whoever was brought to the slaughter that day to fight him in those stare downs, there was no like mean mugging or anything, dude. He just had the most stoic face and his eyes would just never leave. 
And there's this, he does this cool dialogue where he's talking about his walkout, you know, like yeah. walking, the world's starting to fall away. I know. And then he's like, we're in the ring and I make eye contact with him and I know I got him. I watch him fall off. He knows he's done. Mm -hmm. And I remember watching that as a kid and I was just so enamored by his power and his, and his style. He was so fast. He was, no one boxed like that. Mm -hmm. You know, everyone had this very orthodox stance and threw the same style of punches and the way he bobbed and weaved and would just end up behind people like he yeah, I'm his biggest fan. Yeah, man. He's so cool. I, I got to do the Mike Tyson hot boxing podcast. That's a with dream him. of mine. Too. Yeah, dude, he's incredible. It was really fun uh, to be there. And so I'm really thankful for 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 Douglas. Uh, his Instagram is Doug does art. You can go on there at Doug does art. And that's his Instagram. You'll see Donald Duck there. He does it with uh, anybody. And Steven Tyler. Yeah, and Steven Tyler. That's, well, dude, and you think, that. you think of a turnaround story too. Yeah. To see where that guy's heart is at now, man, that healing and the, after everything he's been through, you know, I mean, to get picked up at the age he did and <laughs> I'm just going to say the word exploit because I feel like that's what happened. His, yeah. his anger and his physical ability was exploit. You know, he's like 200 pounds and he's 13. Yeah. And to have that harnessed and exploited in a way that brought him the world, you know, he just went through so much and he was so, he went through these phases of just anger and like, wow, dude, I'm pretty sure that guy would eat another human. <laughs> And to see where he has, is now. I think, he, I think he used to talk about doing it. Yeah. To his yeah. Opponents. Yeah. Dude, you're talking about eating Lennox Lewis's yeah, baby, yeah. <laughs> you know, and like to see him turn around and, and listening to his podcast. Now you can just see his He's heart. Passionate dude. Oh. And so, um, he teared up on the podcast with me and, and told people how important my story was, which I'm, I mean, I'm grateful that he was saying that, but for him to be saying that from the guy that I, <sighs> watched growing up. I mean, whenever I wanted to be uh, a fighter, I looked at people's styles and I don't fight like Mike Tyson, but I looked at him. I looked at Alexander Corellin and I looked at Fedor Emelianenko. Fedor. And these guys had this mentality that I tried to pick up on and it'd be whenever I'm stepping on the mats, but especially when that cage door locks, when that cage door locks, a lot of times people think, uh, for the first professional fight or some of their first ones, like they get anxious, they get anxiety in there. They get, uh, what's that? The first time big under the big lights, um, they call it some sort of fright stage or, fright. Yeah. Stage fright. And, um, and you just are kind of paralyzed by that. I know a guy that literally used to box up if I'll tell you the names after, um, but UFC champions, UFC hall of famers, he would, he would rock them. He'd submit them. He'd take them down. He'd do what he wanted with them, but he'd never make it onto the, the, the main stage because when those lights came on, he was just paralyzed in fear. Mm -hmm. But in the gym, he was, so in, there's those two kind of fighters, right? The guys that love it in the gym, they dominate there. And the other guys that are gamers. Yeah. He just wasn't a gamer. That's real. That's so it's, real. Yeah. It's, it's definitely real. I'm more of a gamer. Like in the gym, I'm not, I'm not going in there to hurt anybody or show off. I'm, I'm just there to train, get better 1% a day. But whenever it's fight night, bro, I want to be like a Tyson Fedor, um, Alexander Well, I remember wrestling. you saying to me, I was asking you about that because Will, my coach is always like, I do really well in the gym. And he's always like, dude, the biggest thing that gets people is that stage fight. Yeah. I don't think it'd get you, you know, yeah, like yeah. you're used to that. But I remember talking to you, like, you know, that's what I ask all my friends that are fighters. Like, what is that like? And I was like, what do you think when they close the cage doors? Like I look across at a dude and go, they just locked you in a cage with me. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And yeah. I'm like, that's a yeah. good mentality yeah, to you're have, not, dude. I'm not locked in here with you. You're, you're locked, locked in here with me, me dude. Yeah. yeah. That's so powerful. I'm coming. Mm -hmm. So buckle up, buttercup. Here it comes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know? Like, well, when uh, I just did that MMA uh, seminar with Lovato, something he said that I thought was so cool is he's like, it doesn't matter if you're a fast starter or a slow starter, but you must make your presence known. Mm. And he was saying like, that was one thing he liked about Connor early in his career. So Lovato was saying like, even if I'm not going to throw another kick the whole fight, I sprint across that shit and throw a front it. kick yep. just to be like, you're in a fight with me right now, mm -hmm. you know? And that like initial shock. And like, to me, that's what's so intriguing about the sport is 
the mentality that goes, okay, how do I get this little edge? And it's like, yeah, you do. Some guy has an idea how this thing's going to go. And then you front kick him in his face. He's like, oh shit. You know, now I have to reset. Yeah. I was, I was on the card. Uh, Raphael and I fought back to back. I fought after him on his Bellator debut. And then he goes on and be, he was the champ, champ. Right. But his Bellator debut, uh, he was the first fight on the main card, uh, televised fight. And he was going to corner me. That was the fight right after him. I was like, okay. I mean, I knew he was going to dominate whoever it was. Cause he just was going to be, yeah, yeah. he was going to be the champion, but he came out there and he knocked that dude out in about 13 seconds with a head kick. I mean, head kicked him. <laughs> And the guy fell over and then tried to stand back up and he just started drilling with knees and ref stopped it. And so he comes back and he's not even, I mean, he's, he's sweaty, but not like he just got done with a real fight. Yeah. And, uh, he puts on my walkout shirt. He's like, all right, here we go. You know, <laughs> Champion, like, wow, dude. <laughs> that's incredible. And just to have that mentality and be able to switch, mm-hmm. um, or flip that switch where, uh, you know, he's in my fight mode. All of a sudden he's in coach mode. I mean, that guy is just brilliant. I'm going to have him on the show too. Gotta. Yeah. Um, he's Dude, incredible. he has, to me, he is the, um, the epitome of what that energy should look like, feel like, be like as, as a, as a martial artist. Yeah. He is so calm and sweet, but confident and stoic and direct. And I, I, I'm, I'm really attracted to that, to that guy's energy. Yeah. Um, yeah. I wish I would've got to spend more time with him when I was in Bozeman, we were supposed to have breakfast, but I had to peel out. Um, yeah, man, he just is a real martial artist. Yeah. He's a real martial artist. Lifelong. I mean, his him and his father, that they story. were uh, oh, the man. first Americans to get a to get, I mean, father, son, to get black belts in jujitsu and the way that they sacrificed to go all around the country sleeping on and the mats world, and sleeping on the mats growing up. Um, that's earned man. Everything yeah. that man has is earned. That's yeah. that again, he's worked again, hard for it. That's what I love about Dustin too, is mm-hmm. like, I've been following his career paid in full. Yeah, man. And I've been following his career since they made that fight land movie years and years ago. So I started following his career when he was doing small shows and always mm-hmm. checking in. And then when he was in the UFC, I mean, uh, 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 you know, ups and downs, ups and downs. And he just, there was never a down where he was like, well, I guess this means this. He was just like, no hiccup. Yeah. Man. I wish, I wish you could have uh, been there. Oh my the God. With us. Dude. And uh, the thing that no one talks about, cause everyone talks about what a sweet person Dustin is. He is a good, good fighter. Yeah. Oh my God, dude. His boxing, his jujitsu. Like he might be the most well-rounded mm-hmm. mixed martial artist in the game. Yeah. Man, uh, he, he absolutely could be. He, uh, before the fight, donated 50,000. I can celebrate now that uh, after the fight, they're sending another 60,000. Uh, so 110,000 help us uh, finish out the 32 homes that we're building. We've already built, I think, 17 of the homes. And we're doing um, sanitation hygiene, so latrines outside separately. And um, but they have these big metal roofs, metal doors. They're having piped water to their homes. I mean, coming oh from twig God. and leaf huts to two bedroom homes, dude. Even that video water. of them turning water on and yeah. like, oh my God, yeah. you know, like this is water that we can yeah. drink coming out of this thing. Yeah, yeah I mean, now it's going to be a pharmacy, uh, a medical clinic. Pharmacies are going to be stocked. Medical clinics going to be staffed. Um, and it's, we might be partnering with a group very soon that we could get some more land and we could bring back some of the forest right there that they're attached to it. And so we've already replanted over 4,000 trees and now it's like, we're doing the sustainable farming and then we want to, you know, it's just, it's just grown into so much more because of like people, like if you're watching, I'm pointing at Mike Tyson, having me on a show, Dustin Poirier going into the biggest fight of his career. Yeah. The trilogy fight, deciding to represent fight for the forgotten. It's incredible. Amy, what was that like for you being there live? That was only your second fight to be at live. It's a right? hell of a, hell of an event. <laughs> <laughs> I know I'm spoiled now. Right. Um, it was amazing. And I just the shout out at the end meant so much, you know, that Dustin yeah, that had me willing uh, to do that, that me and, jazz too. Yeah. and lift that up. I think that's so cool and says a lot about who he is. Yeah. Person. So, but of course the fight itself was fantastic too. Cause I mean, 
Dude, I could go all day on that, but yeah. yeah, I mean, dude, he was kicking the shit out of Connor. It was like yeah. he's like, well, yeah, dude, you did break your foot, but you were having a rough go, bro. That was <laughs> yeah. a ten eight round for sure. Be glad yeah. you broke your foot. Yeah. You got out easier. Yeah, well, it was it was. Uh, my life is just shaping up into something that I am so honored and grateful for. Well, you deserve every um, single bit of it, dude. Thank you, bro. You really do. Thank you to be able to celebrate that with Amy by my side. Um, Thanks, babe. Yeah. You know, it's the first, first show with you being the producer. I want to, I want to marry that woman, Drew. <laughs> yeah. It's a good idea. <laughs> it's a it's good, a good idea. idea. I got to follow in your footsteps yeah. and, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be really good. I think we asked you already to sing at our wedding. I'm there, dude. Didn't I we? already told you I'm there. Yeah. 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 <laughs> wow. This is so cool that, uh, that this would be what I get to do, you know, as this grows, um, and we get sponsors and, and we get to direct more funds to fight for the forgotten and tell people that story. We we're talking earlier and you said that retiring is, is, is backwards. Yeah. And I've thought that from watching the pygmy people and how they live, then even Jewish culture, like there, there isn't retirement. Yeah. Um, you just, for you me, just it's work. And yeah. You, you, and you do what you love. That's right? it. And if you're doing what you love, it doesn't feel like work. Yeah. I mean, there's going to be, even when it does, does, it's like honorable. It's work. You're excited you to do. You still love it. Yeah. I don't like this part of it, but if I do this, I get to do more of what I love. Yep. And so, um, I'm really excited for this podcast journey. What you, you have your own podcast. Yeah. Uh, the sad song podcast for me, man, my podcast only goal is in, it is an excuse for me to talk to really interesting people. Okay. And we have really interesting conversations. So yeah. And the more interesting people I know, the more interesting people say yes. Yeah. So they're like, Oh, well, for shot said, yes, I guess I'll do it. You know? Yeah. So it's like, it's that, that's been the thing of it, you know, was tracing back the whole thing started obviously with COVID, I was just like, well, I'm home. I got to do something. But it was tracing back this guy named Chase Gamble, uh, who's one of the sweetest dudes I've ever met. Uh, shout out Jimmo in North Carolina. Um, I saw a video of him walking out to I am. So reached out to him and him and that whole gym came to a show in Charlotte. And then yeah. I went and trained with them, but I was tracing this song back of like, how the fuck did you end up walking out to the song? I traced it back to Benson Henderson mm. was who was sharing this song with everyone. Wow. And then from there on, it just like, I kept going down this wormhole of having crazy people on. And then I reached out to TJ Dillashaw and he was like, yeah, man, I'll do it. I was like, Oh, really? <laughs> you know, like you haven't talked to anybody in a year. It was like, you know, three quarters of the way through a suspension. So it's for me, I just keep asking cool people and they keep saying yes. So for me, I'm just, um, I just like talking to people, man. Yeah. That's you awesome. Know? So what is, uh, for me learning, and uh, I mean, there might be someone thinking about starting a podcast and Amy also, what's, what's the best way to go get interesting people? How do you ask? I just, dude, I just ask. And cause it's like, dude, if you say no, I'm like, oh, all right, well, I'm in the same spot I was a minute yeah. ago. And you try and, to keep it as short as possible. Hey, will you do my podcast? Or do you explain yeah, a little bit? So of if it's are? like, so if, if I'm asking like a fighter, right. That I'd have no relationship with. I'm like, hey, man, you know, I typically have artists, activists and fighters on. And here's some of the fighters I've had on, you know, so like if you're reaching out to a fighter to be like, well, I've had Justin Wren, Rafael Lovato, then someone's like, oh, OK, you know. So for me, like when TJ said yes, I, in my brain, I was like, that just opened so many doors. <laughs> you know what I was like? I'm like, because if someone finds out that TJ did it, they're like, OK, well, that must be a legit thing. And really, I'm just like, I just tricked you into talking to me for 90 minutes. You know, <laughs> like, it increased your cred. Yeah. Just moving on so up. it's and, and, and it's amazing how many people actually also just want to have conversations like I've gotten. I don't even think I've who said no. J John Wayne Parr said no. OK which I later found out was probably for the best. Cause he's kind of a handful, I guess, in a conversation, but I think John Wayne Parr is the only one that said, he's no a to kickbox me. for Amy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. But it, uh, I've, I've only gotten one. No. And then even when he said, no, I was just like, Oh, he literally was like, no man, best of luck though. I'm not really interested. And I was like, Oh, okay. You know, it didn't change my day. So, yeah. um, what, uh, what, who do you think would be good to have on my show? Oh man, Lovato! Andy, you can throw some Lovato. Out. I think That's is great, him. just because you guys have a relationship, yeah. and he's such an interesting cat. His story is so amazing too. But I'd like to hear more about your guys's connection. Yeah, yeah. So uh, definitely him. Um, Dustin would be phenomenal. I just like yeah. you know, I man to We're be at that Dustin. level. We hope to get Mike. Uh, yeah, Mike Tyson. Mike Tyson. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, man. I just Joe Rogan said yes. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. So I said he would do it. Now I just got to get him on the schedule. Yeah. 
So that'd be pretty Yeah, cool. I mean, dude, that... <laughs> Well, that every door is open now, you know. So, <laughs> yeah, I don't think anyone will say no. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, lots of cool people, man, that are really interesting and do an amazing thing, you know. And anyone that knows you can see your heart. Mm. So, someone, I don't think anyone's going to say no. We were at dinner, and Kelly Slater said yes. To yeah, last night, man, boom. I'm so pumped about that. We got Laird and Gabby going to come on. And there's just going to be some some really incredible guests. Yeah, I'm so excited I, for you, man. Thank you. I think what I really want as a main theme, though, is really digging down, hey, digging down, drilling into yeah. the tactics of how people overcome the greatest challenges in their lives, how they overcame, but we're all in the process of overcoming. Mm -hmm. So anyone listening to this should know I still struggle. Uh, you still Same. struggle. Yeah. yeah. Um, and the work is never done. But we want to we want to talk about that work that, yep. that it that it took to overcome and to be resilient to to be a person of fortitude, strength. How to fortify yourself, your mind, your soul, your spirit. Yes. But how to how to have thick skin, but maintain a soft heart. Yes, that's you know? great. Yeah, yeah. Because I think sometimes um, I look back at my earlier years uh, when I was just a fighter. I was just thickening my, yeah. And I was thickening my skin and hardening my heart. Yeah. Well, I went through a phase two in my jujitsu journey where, you know, I was a dude in Shanji soul read me, mm. you know, I went through this phase as a blue belt where I was really aggressive. I wanted to kill everyone because I wanted my purple belt and I wanted to kill everyone in the gym. So there would just be a pile of bodies of which I could stand and be like, <laughs> I am this, you yeah. know, and I just completely destroyed my body during that phase yeah. of, of my life. But, um, Shanji said something to me. We don't know each other well. We've only hung out that one time training. And he reached out to me after hearing the music and he just said, Hey man, you should fight with your essence. Wow. Don't be a wild animal. The same essence that you put into your music, that's what you should be fighting with. Wow. That's actually strong. I chewed on that for now. Still. Yeah, I still that's, think that's, of that that's, daily. That's really, really good because um I can I can see that flow in your music, right? And we've we've grappled some. The thing that Raphael and his dad, uh, senior and Shanji have done together is they've perfected this art to have like timeless jujitsu. Yes. Raphael talks yep. about, right? You, you tore up your body. I've torn up my body. Now it's time to preserve that body. Like, let's not beat it down as much. Let's build it back up. Yeah. And so that's what your music does is builds people back up. So build yourself up while you're in there. Yes. And if you build up others while you're teaching them. You know, like if you make your, this is what I love about like Nikki Rod and Gordon Ryan and those guys, they aren't competing against the rest of the world. This is what they told me. It's like, we're not competing against the rest of the world. We're competing against each other. Mm -hmm. And if I can, if I can submit you and then I tell you how to stop it and you get better and now I have to find new ways to get it. I'm getting better. Yes. And to me, so, that's the magic of the sport, right? Yeah. Because it's just like, okay, we're all of these people from different walks of life and we're coming in, in here trying to effectively simulate murder on each other. And the the things that happen while that's happening internally is you go out into the world and you're like, oh, it's just this big metaphor. Mm. You know, I said, uh, you know, when I hurt my neck real bad, I, I came to a belt test soon after. And I couldn't roll. I couldn't turn my head. You know, I uh, didn't have any feeling in two of my fingers. You need those. Yeah. And I, I put those. my, put my gi on and I stepped on the mat and I started crying and Will came over and was like, dude, it's not about fighting. We're literally learning how to live our lives together. Mm. You know, that's what we're doing in here. The rest of it is <laughs> smoke and mirrors, man. Yeah, I well, think, I think two of the best things I've heard about black belts is a black belt is just a white belt who never quit. Mm -hmm. So don't quit. And then a black belt is like, a, a person of service. Yes. A true black belt's going to give, 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 give on the mat. And, but not just only on the mat it's done there. He's going to do it outside. Yeah. Will is, Will too. is the, the owner of the grindhouse, man. Will Grunhauser is one of the greatest mentors I've ever seen. His superpower is he knows exactly how to talk to each individual and exactly what to say to bring out the best in them. Mm -hmm. I, I, the, the life transformations that I've seen in our gym, not just because of his savage jujitsu, but because of the way he mentors and he knows how to talk to each person and give them exactly what they need. Dude, I credit him so much with my personal growth because he could say things to me that nobody else could say because I could meet it with aggression. I could meet it combatively. 
can't give that to Will. You yeah. know, and that's not the energy you want to give to that man. Yeah. So, you know, he just knew exactly what seeds to plant and how to talk to me to get mm. me to work through my shit in that room, you know. So I wasn't just in there doing jujitsu, I was in there doing self-work, you know. And that's like you said, man, and that's that's the vibe that I get from Lovato mm -hmm. is that he is this. Well, that's how they change lives is through martial arts and martial arts does change lives. So if someone's listening to this and, and, and you think we're just talking fight talk, we're talking life life and, and it might be something good for you to try spiritual path, um, man. That's yeah. what I tell people. That's my jujitsu is my religion. That's how I relate to the rest of the world. You mm. know? Well, I, I do love that on the mats. I mean, it does not matter what race color, creed, Job, religion, anything, money, how much money you have, how much you don't, everybody's equal. And it's all, well, the mats are an and equalizer. They, and well, they never lie. Yeah. You know, yeah, it's so honest. Yeah. You just are where you are. You are where you are. And I mean, everyone's not necessarily equal because there's definitely different yeah, there's a hierarchy. Yeah, there's yeah. A, but, but like everybody, no one's talking politics, religion, nope. all that stuff. It's that was like, in that, in that to me during the polarizing time of the election and COVID and all of that changed my entire worldview of just like, no, dude, I have friends that are cops. I have friends that are criminals. I have friends that are firefighters. I have friends that are conservative friends that are liberal. And it's like, doesn't matter in there, dude, we'd all take a bullet for each other. Yeah. So like, let's just live like that. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? You yeah. know, let's just love everyone and treat everyone with yeah. that respect. Let's all help each other get better. Mm -hmm. Let's all help each other do hard things. Yes. It's all, I mean, it's just, it really is good principles for just a way to live. Yep. I mean, man, well, brother, I love you, man. I love you too, dude. I'm so grateful for you having me. Yeah. This has been awesome. Yeah. Uh, I mean, literally from a Instagram message to dear, dear friends, the dude. songs to, to one of, yeah, dear, dear friends. One of the things that was so in, uh, inspiring to me was you playing or dedicating a song to me at Antones. That was uh, my dedicating honor. I am to me. I was over there with Amy and she had her arms around. I had my arms around you. You had your arms around me. We're listening to that together. And it was just like such, I just, I just felt like so blessed just to like hear that. And then you sing it over me in here. <laughs> to ayahuasca to me having bigs ups and downs and you being there for me the whole time always through. here buddy your wife your kids you're you're a beautiful man peach likewise if, if, if no one didn't if, if you're just listening to this audio you gotta go uh you know you gotta go see this man and his fantastic mustache right now <laughs> i gotta I shave him before i get home my wife hates it <laughs> but amy should i grow to mind that thick the mustache you think you can grow it thicker yeah, Take just grow the length on the side. Oh, you, can, you can twist yeah, her up. So. Oh, that. Yeah, sure. Why not? Go for it. Go for that. Give, yeah. it, a, give it a whirl. I will have to talk to the, my my barber. See if <laughs> just let it go. Let it let it flow. <laughs> Anyways, man, I love you. Is there anything that you want people to to check out? Obviously, your Spotify. Yeah, your just Instagram. listen to our music. I don't have anything to sell you. Um, listen to our music, and you know we're we're going pretty much everywhere but the Northeast this fall. Go to a show. It yeah, is one come, of the coolest. It's my favorite live show. Yeah. Thank you, man. It really is. I mean, yeah, with the, your, yours, whenever I came, it was just, just, uh, me. just you. Yeah. And we're going to man show. We're a five piece band now, man. It's a really big sound. Um, it's really fun. We have so much fun on stage. Um, I just, I love what I do, man. And I love doing it with the people that I do it with. And we're going pretty much everywhere. Yeah, I saw Minnesota and Florida and California, All over the Midwest, all over the West coast, Southeast. Yeah, we're going everywhere, North but Carolina. the Northeast this fall. Yeah. Wow. That's incredible, so man. Come, come check out a show. Say what's up. Yeah. I would love to come out. I'm going to find one to come to. Well, December here in Austin. Yeah. If you're in Austin, come out there. You'll see both Drew and I and Amy. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be awesome. Man, I love you. And love you too, bro. appreciate you. And you are one of the best men I have ever known. Likewise. Thank you. Likewise. Thank you, dude. What an episode with Drew McManus, one of my dear friends. I've had such a stellar relationship with this human uh summer his wife's incredible his kiddos we've gotten to meet them and the way that he's personally impacted my life and i hope how he has impacted your life right now after you have listened this or while you're listening to his story he's just incredible i love him i feel like you're gonna love him and go check out his music Go check out one of his concerts live. He's on tour coming up very soon, like just weeks away. Go check out tickets. Make sure that they're not sold out because oftentimes they are anywhere he goes. 
Well, I know for Austin, they may add another Antone's date if he sells it out. So, well, he's, he's and we're going to come to that. So we're going. So come if you're in us. Austin, come see us. We'll be mm-hmm. at the first and maybe the second because we get to hang out with him in the green room and stuff. And he's just the best. He's one of the best guys. He will move you. His song Grow is an invitation for you to grow between talking about, you know, we're living in this time in between where we want to be, you know, uh, you know, it's a journey and that's what it's all about. And yeah, I, I love this guy. We are adding in at the end of this. Don't close your browser, your Spotify, Apple podcast, uh, your YouTube yet, because Raiden's story is still to come. The third of the three part series, the first one starting with Jared Padalecki, who impacted Raiden's life. The second being RJ Mitty, who overcame bullying himself in this one now because because uh, Drew had experienced bullying as well. And it's one of the reasons he became a fighter. And so make sure you stay tuned for Raiden's story. You'll see how Fight for the Forgotten has impacted at least one young man's life. We've been in his life for two years now. I've seen him grow up looking eye to eye with me, weighing almost as much as I do and sparring with me in the ring this last weekend. And so uh, I think you're really going to be inspired by that. If you want to join us, become part of the mission and vision of Fight for the Forgotten, you can join our fight club. You can donate monthly to us and it helps us immensely know exactly how we can impact people's lives, like continuing to impact Raiden's life or other Raidens because there's 13 million a year just in the United States that deal with bullying just like he did. Maybe not on the same scale, but we are going to be impacting them. An app is to come with character development, bullying prevention, suicide awareness through Fight for the Forgotten and our impact with the Pygmy people which we will always have and are committed to for the next decade to come and beyond. We've been in existence over a decade already. And for the podcast to help this grow into the most meaningful podcast in the world, you can like, share, follow. It used to be called subscribe and you can leave a review on Apple podcasts because that will absolutely help us. And I would love to hear how you are thinking these episodes are going. If you have any suggestions on questions that I can ask the guest, you know, how they overcome their greatest challenges and how they put love and compassion in action through their life, mission and vision and purpose, what they do as a vocation or how they give back. We would love to hear directly from you. We got a ton of great comments already on YouTube on a lot of the episodes. So thank you, everybody. Yeah, please leave us comments on YouTube. Please leave us a review so we get feedback. And please go to our email. Yeah. Leave us your overcome story at Mm -hmm. overcomepodcast at gmail.com. Yeah. We really are looking forward to hearing from you. Mm -hmm. And we hope that you share this. We'll we'll repost it on our Instagrams at the big pygmy at Overcome with Justin Wren, at Real Amy Edwards, Mm -hmm. my rock star babe. (laughs) And I really hope that this uh, episode really inspired you, inspired you to grow, inspired you to overcome, let you know that you, you deserve to be here. So do I, so does Amy. But if you're hearing our voice, if you heard Drew's story, you deserve to be here. And so thank you on it for sponsoring this podcast. Thank you, hot pie. And we absolutely love our listeners. We're so grateful for you. And yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate you being here. Have a great week. Raiden, I've seen a video of those kids bullying you and it really made me upset. But what got me in that whole video of those kids trying to break you and just your reaction, you know, you didn't seem to get broken by them. I heard you're going to surf for the first time today, so a couple things, you always keep your eyes on the horizon, never turn your back on the ocean, and then when you're laying on your board, you always look where you're going. You don't look where you don't want to go, you look where you want to go. Kind of like life. You are in the ocean. I look forward to seeing the videos. I got some boards up here. Come by my house, you can grab one of them. You have fun. 
Get some waves. First time ever in the ocean. What do you guys think? It's uh, cold! It's cold! It's cold, but it's awesome. It's cold, awesome. but it's awesome? Yeah. It's salt water. Did you learn how to surf today? You gotta have some cool surfing guys. Hey, I'm Alex. Nice to meet you. I'm I can't right. wait to take you surfing. First time ever in the ocean. Yep. Think of all the people you're helping in this world right now, right? Bullying is something that is so rampant right now, but you guys putting this message out is extremely important. It's about teaming up with the right people that empower you and give you that strength to rise you up. We're all part of the same tribe of people that have big hearts and care about those that, you know, need that little boost in life. I want to get you, you got to get them out in the water. It's time for you to be a surfer. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Gotta catch your first wave. Yeah. Sand in your toes. Actually, three waves I caught. There you go. All right, my man. And so let me ask you. On the way here, you thought you didn't want to surf, right? Were you nervous? Yeah. I was nervous too. But sometimes you just gotta be courageous, right? And then what happens? Good things happen. Yeah. So I've learned in life that sometimes when you get out of your comfort zone, the coolest things happen. So I'm proud of you for being courageous. In that. Oh! Raiden, come forth. Take a knee right below here. By the holy order of San Martin and the power vested in me, I dub thee Sir Raiden, knight of your realm. You may rise. Tip hip. Hooray! Hip hip. Hooray! Hip hip. Hooray! I'm walking through the hallway, and next thing you know, surprise! surprise! Happy birthday, Happy buddy! Happy birthday, brother! There you go, buddy! <laughs> he hasn't had birthday parties that weren't family members, cousins, and so for him to feel like he has a thousand friends, which he now does, it's, uh, I'm pretty positive it's making him feel really, really good. <laughs> I see a cake that has a flash on it. Going away party for the family and early birthday for Raiden. Hello? Uh, I heard there was a birthday party. Um, <laughs> yeah, I had to show up. And next you know, Diego from the movie Door of the Explorer, which was Malachi. Hi, I'm Malachi. Malachi. Nice to meet you. <laughs> Happy birthday, man. And Brock from SEAL Team. It was just so amazing. Father, we want to thank you for this day. We want to thank you for this amazing gathering and allowing my son to have an amazing birthday party. <laughs> Um, it's something he's never really gotten to do. And it's cool that we get to experience it with a bunch of new friends. Justin included, he's part of the family and all these guys that are here. Uh, they're a huge part of our family now. So I just can't thank you enough and let's eat some food. There's really something special about Raiden and his, his family. There's only so much hashtags that you can do in life. If you want change to happen, you have to be part of that change and physically go out and make a difference. So if you can get a kid to be a kid again. Wow, you are with Chewy. You're with Chewy, my man. Allow him to like have an imagination and, and see big things and be inspired and be around, you know, positive affirmation. And this is a great way that we can all work together in, in a way that Raiden's gonna thrive, that Brock's gonna thrive, that both mom and dad are gonna thrive. I've been through what Raiden's been through. From eight years old to 13 years old, I was relentlessly bullied. Where is it? Right here. Where is it? It's right there. This is my chance. Right this is my opportunity right. to come alongside a young man like my coaches um, did for me. And so I, I want to be a coach for him, whether that's in martial arts or wrestling, but really in life. Tell me how people would treat him at school. They would treat him bad. They think he's not strong, but he is. 
I went through the same thing that you went through. And now look at where I am. Because I know how he is. He has a steel heart. I'm hoping Raiden has gained some confidence that he has some friends because he's never had true friends. Big 13, you're a teenager now. You're a teenager, bro. Step into the manhood. Having all these guys come together and just show their love, support, and give their their personal input and their personal teachings was awesome. And I don't think that us as parents could ask for anything better. Everything that the boys have gotten to do are once in a lifetime things. And just them being surrounded with such high moral, high character gentlemen, that means the most to me. I've had a lot of uh, People give me their personal phone numbers and say, hey, please stay in contact with me. I want to follow you guys. I want to make sure you guys are safe. And I just want to be a part of your family. And I'm that type of person that that's where we're at. And they're going to be a part of my family for life. I know uh, you guys lost your restaurant and you like the barbecue. So my buddies at Traeger, uh, which is the best barbecues out there, they, they gifted you guys a brand new Wi-Fi. Barbecue, it's electric, it, you can bake, you can smoke. My buddy owns Law Mattresses, and I, he, I shared this story, and uh, he had a message for you. Raiden, we stand with you, and we appreciate what you're doing to stamp out bullying and violence. So to help you with your fight, uh, we want to give you and your family a bunch of our product so you can have better sleep at night, so comfortable uh, stuff, and mattresses are coming your way, buddy. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Raven. Happy birthday to you. I'd say it's been a very, very fun trip, and we love all of you that supported us. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Everything that uh, we did this week meant a lot to me, to my heart. Uh, it made me feel loved in my heart. When a kid says uh, that he feels loved, it just, it just made it feel like uh, all of this was worth it. Like, uh, I felt like I, I had a little bit of an impact on his life and it, it, uh, it felt really good. It really didn't overwhelm me, so thanks. Hey, don't forget to send your Overcome stories to overcomepodcast at gmail.com. And also, rate, review, subscribe, and follow Overcome with Justin Wren.